Hey guys, and welcome to the Raw Barbell Club podcast. I'm your host, coach, and all around good guy, Andy, and today I'm here with Peter Tyson. Peter Tyson. Hi, Andrew. So, not only is Peter a very strong master's weightlifter, like, what's your deadlift right now? Uh, 210. 210. How much do you weigh? Uh, 85. And how old are you? Uh, 30, uh, 57. 57 years old. And you got a 210 kilo deadlift. Do that. That's so pretty impressive, right? It uh, t- takes a long time to get to that level, and you only do it once every three or four months. Because, <laughs> so you know about it when you finish it. But essentially, when you're on a weekly basis, 190 would be just a nice warm up and get to there, and then you know you've done a good session. But when you start to, you've got to work your way back up again every time to get to that. Uh, peak like anything that we do in any form of training you you uh, go through um, you work to a, a high point and I mean that's not the only thing interesting about you because you brought some cool stuff for me today some of the training some of that nutrition and I would point out I'm a sports dietitian and I've been a dietitian for about 25 years in the public system and have been in the private system for about three years now moving and it's a five-year plan for me to shift right across and essentially, still out there for whether we're an elite athlete or the general pop- population, some of the training tools that we've all might be aware of, uh, the old food pyramid. But what, what, what I've got here today is uh, the plate model. It's very cool. Uh, a lot of people, it is a real plate, well, made of plastic, but a lot of people don't see the, the visual message about it. I've had times where people want to purchase it so they can just lay their food on top of them. That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a training t- uh, tool. And essentially, it's a visual uh, message, and I have, and we'll have time to uh, run through what we're seeing in front of us. But hopping online for anybody uh, looking at a plate model, whether it's the American, with the Australian, Canadian, um, UK, it's a common type of education tool that you see most in uh, in, in English and non-English uh, thing, because it's not the, in terms of a literacy skill. It's a, it's a visual mode of education rather than a um, Rather, rather than a written, and so it covers all uh, languages. So you'd find it in Italy as much as you would see it in uh, Birmingham. One of the uh, reasons I wanted to get you on was a while ago you started working with uh, Odd Sox Weightlifting, uh, Steve Tickenden and Pete Hardyman's gym, and you've been helping a lot of their lifters. Uh, well, first off, if you're part of the weightlifting, powerlifting, fighting, any of those scenes, you know that those are weight class sports. Mm-hmm. We also forget um, throwing and uh, hammer your throwing is a very much a skill uh, weight training type of sport as well too. So are there weight classes in hammer throwing? Not weight on? classes, oh. but it's the same type of dietary recommendations. Okay. And we're working with that type of uh, hypertrophy uh, skill based training and, and just off, on and off seasons. Unlike a team sport where you have to perform week after week, uh, a sport like uh, weightlifting, powerlifting, or, or your throwing, you might only have three, maybe four times a year where you have to be at peak level. So essentially, and at peak weight, at, at peak weight as well. And so I happened to, I was running, uh, had been run, a, a runner, uh, probably uh, into late thirties, a bit of running. It was hurting, and I thought I needed to do a little bit of. Uh, uh, weight training at the same time. So I'm in the 40s. I was looking at the local gym where my daughters swim. There's a couple of young fellas on an um, inclined bench doing some um, flies. And I thought to myself, now that doesn't look interesting. What's it going to take? What's going to make it interesting for me to do a bit of a weight training program? And still to this day, I cannot ask, answer the question, why Olympic weightlifting? But I was <laughs> just there, as in the moment, I was asking that question, what's going to make it interesting for me? Let's take up Olympic weightlifting. Then I thought to myself, okay, I'm 48 at that time. I'm not just going to take up Olympic weightlifting. What do I need to do uh, for a 12-month period, I thought, to get myself into a position where it might be possible to take up Olympic weightlifting? So I thought, okay, uh, next 12 months, three times a week with a local uh, PT, um, we, we, a lot of conditioning, really a lot of conditioning, above and beyond, and the weight training, and then after 12 months, well, let's give it a go. Well, what, what did your training look like when you first started? Oh, literally uh, high reps, lightweights, um, and eventually throwing up in the local garden outside <laughs> for a first three months. Just, I remember one time my daughter's uh, coach um, walked past and I, <laughs> I was eating in the local garden and I was yelled out to Kath, Kath, can I take up swimming? It's got to be, it's gotta be a lot easier than this. But that passed. We got through that. 
steps. But I had a goal that said to me, yes, I knew I needed to pass, go through this process. Um, and three or four months later, that conditioning it really improved and you're doing the training uh, above and beyond what you started off with and, you're doing, and you, that's what you expect should be seeing. And then after 12 months, right, let's see where I need to go to take this sport on. I did do a little bit of research prior to that. I knew there was a club at, well, I was working in Lithgow and there was a club at um, Bathurst and there was a club in Goulburn. And I thought, okay, you know, after 12 months, I'll go and see those guys. Unbeknownst to me in that 12 months of training, though, both of those clubs had closed. It used to be a Goulburn and a weightlifting club. Oh, there, okay. So further ringing around, um, and I ended up at, uh, at Homebush under the auspices of uh, Luke Borogini at one, and a retired uh, Olympic head coach. Wow. All of a sudden, I'm amongst all of these elite athletes. Um, and just being in that environment of Homebush itself, arriving there and just seeing all the other runners, bicyclists, uh, swimmers, and I thought, now, nah. all of a sudden I thought to myself, this might take me somewhere else in terms of profession as well too, because I was working public. Hmm, I wonder if this might work out as a, a private industry. So, but that was, I just put that in the back of my head. But over time we come to realise, well, maybe I'm, I might like to move from the chronic condition type of uh, individuals I've been seeing for over 25 years. To a um, uh, to, to a elite athlete type of role, and that's the journey I've been on for the last you know, three or four years. And so here I am. I've made that transition out of the hospital system into a, into the private, and I've ended up with uh, Steve Tuckerman and Peter Heidemann at Odd Socks. And so I'm a dietitian there, but a nice little office and um, uh, bookshelf, and I can see people up there if they want to come over and have a chat. So one of the really cool people. Um, and I'm sure she doesn't mind me talking about her, is Liz. Mm. Um, Liz dropped from, uh, what weight class was she in originally? Uh, Mid-60s somewhere, yeah. and she's heading down to the low 60s, if not the 58. I think it. she competed as yeah. a 58. Yes. And not and only not only did her weights not decline, they actually improved, right? The, the, her, her lifting capacity. Yes. Yeah, in terms of weight. And that's the important juggle that we have to realise. You're trying to uh, lose weight, but keep that strength up at the same time. And that's the that's, that's what I'm. That's where I specialise. And now uh, I want to talk about two main things today. First is uh, health and fitness, and eating for just overall strength. Mm -hmm. And then the second is obviously, uh, you know, cutting weight for a competition. Because as you get into those elite levels, that is something that we do. And it's not something that a lot of people do safely. No. We, there is a biological um, size that most people naturally like to be at. The body's there, it likes to sit. And it's what we call a set weight theory. A lot of people, and um, we have. And so people find, a lot of people out there find it very frustrating not being able to lose those last three or four kilos. Uh, they're fighting their genes, really, and, and the body wins a lot of the time, or you do lose that weight now, but you become weak. So there is, only, there is only a certain level that we can get down before you find that your body's just not going to, um, not going to do the, the work, the sport. So we, have to we need to find that, uh, and that takes practice. And so uh, we, during that time of off-season or training somewhere, if you want to find a level your body weight can perform at, then that's the time to trial that. It's not, not a time to test your strength at a drop body weight a week out of uh, a competition. Um, you're setting yourself up for failure, generally that. Uh, now we recommend, especially in weight categories, uh, Olympic weightlifting, trying to achieve a two kilo uh, body weight above the expected uh, competition. And because essentially that last week prior to competition, you'll lose those two kilos. One, essentially you become a lot nervous, your appetite depresses naturally, um, you don't feel hungry but you're still able to perform well. And essentially that day before we can lose a kilo just by uh, a flight that you might be on, a drive. Um, uh, again, you're just getting that closer to the time that you're, you're about to lift and the body really lifts its um, internal uh, metabolism and it can drop quite nicely. But if you want to drop something like three or four kilos over the last week or so, you are setting yourself up for failure. You can get there, um, it means, um, really restricting your calorie intake above and beyond what you normally appetite. So you're going to be quite uh, undernourished on the day of, of performance. And it really shows up in the clean and jerk. 
Yeah. That's where you're going to find that you, you're just going to, that's, you might get the first one in, clean and jerk, and then that's it. You, you're pretty much, uh, that's the end of your competition for you. Particularly that jerk, right? Yes, just so in that, using those legs and you need to power that bar above your head, that's, that's gone. So essentially by being that, set yourself, the next competition I'm going to be at body weight, if it's practical, and then setting yourself a task of being about that two kilos above, a good six weeks prior to that. And so we're training that that way. We know the body's effective. We can do a peak and a trough over those last six weeks. And then we, and then we can drop those last two, week, two kilos in that week. And we know we shouldn't see any um, measurable uh, decline in the, in the performance. And that's sort of what you recommend as the safest way yes, to drop yes, weight. Yes. And it's also the, probably the most consistent way you can drop weight. Um, and that's a good, uh, when we up and down our weight, we're, uh, we're getting weak all the time. Yeah, and a lot of people's, and, and it becomes a, um, becomes a inappropriate way of thinking about your sport without being, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, puts too much um, thought processes into your mind. And that it detracts from what you're, the purpose of what you're doing. You're trying to perform a sport, and essentially, rather than spending time doing, practicing, and uh, performing, you're overthinking processes, and that that it can, it really drives that brings down your performance levels. Especially in a sport that already requires so much <laughs> thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Very technical sport, Olympic weightlifting, isn't it? Very technical, and a lot of training, a lot of effort, a lot of um, commitment to this sport. And nutrition is a very important part of that training process. Uh, often we say uh, any type of activity, sport especially, 80% uh, of what your outcome is basically around your nutrition and 20% of your sports particip um, your participation. So a very big component. Yet we play, um, give not enough um, interest or not enough um, knowledge about uh, what nutrition, how it plays an important role for us day to day, both a training type of diet, a weight uh, tra training, whether you're trying to lose weight or, or increase weight in fact too, and the, um, the, your um, competition diet, yeah, eating habits as well. So there are times, there are places for all types, there is no food out there you can never have. That's what I generally believe, and essentially there are time and places for it. And, um, even the old Maccas, or, or a takeaway food. What is Bow Love? KFC <laughs> right before a competition? <laughs> there, are, there are places. <laughs> so we don't beg, uh, we don't uh, decry any food, but there are times and there are places for them. And um, we see takeaway foods uh, a regular part of a week, weekly diet for a lot of people. And we probably. Uh, that comes about essentially Friday night, we want something quick and easy. Saturday, you've played a sport in the morning, the coach takes you out, where do you go? And then on a Sunday afternoon, you get gather with your friends and where do you go there? So, so uh, a common type and uh, part of our week to week um, environment, our takeaway foods. They're a special treat and that's how they should be. Um, you're going on your annual driving holiday to Brisbane and that's when you have uh, stop, I remember, uh, well, stop on the highway. Yeah, well, I, I promise you one little story I have. Um, Dubbo used to be a once a year um, dietitians meet up, and well, we'd all meet in Wellington at six o'clock in the morning for pancakes, and you've got a gaggle of dietitians here. <laughs> but it was once a year, so <laughs> that's right. I, um, yeah, so you should be able to remember when I when I talk about diet, uh, special treats, uh, you shouldn't be able to remember the last time you had them. I still remember the last time I had KFC, and I still have the taste in my mouth, sorry. KFC. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been quite a while since I've ever been in KFC. Um, I'm going to uh, just add something quickly. Um, there, there, is, uh, there are a lot of people that cut weight for a competition by cutting water from their body. And if you're cutting a lot of water, first off, that is pretty unsafe. And then the second thing is, what you'll notice is that your body will build up a resistance to cutting that water. Well, the so. kidneys play a very important role in how well we keep ourselves hydrated. So essentially, yes, you can make the kidneys overwork, but it comes to a point where the body uh, just knows it will not, it, it, it needs to keep itself alive. 
if it's going to lose an excess amount of fluid that it's going to make you faint, where it's going to send your blood pressure through the roof, where it's not allowing the um, exchange of nutrients from the blood supply into the cell and reverse, just because there's just not enough uh, fluid volume there, your body's just going to stop losing fluid. So it, there is a point where the kidneys will say, well, stop this, so you can't make it go any further. But prior to that, even though you can still make your body at the same things happening, your blood pressure's up, you're not getting that exchange of nutrients, um, you're not going to perform. You simply, the blood pressure, your heart rate's going to go through, your, your mind is not clear. Uh, essentially, well, all that muscle memory development that you've, um, that you've done through training can go literally out the window because the, just the muscles aren't going to react as quick and as uh, efficiently as the, what you did all that training for. So um, weight sh losing weight by uh, fluid lo overloading, it's not for uh, even elite athletes. It's just not a performance. There are people out there that do it and they, and they uh, um, swear by it. Um, but there are, if you think about 100 people in a particular sport, maybe that one person might have that little edge. So it is not something that even has a big impact for a big number of sports people. It's a very, uh, it's a type of activity, um, weight loss activity that performs very little uh, benefit for the vast majority of us. Hmm. Um, what about saunering? Saunering, uh, half a kilo. If you've got to lose half a kilo you can, in a couple of hours, you can get away with that. Okay, then as long as you've got time then to re, uh, rehydrate. Um, Which is cutting it probably the closest on a two hour way in, right? Yes. As if you're a boxer they'll, uh, or a uh, jockey, it's a very common uh, strategy for those guys. Because so 24 hour way in. They've got that time frame where you can rehydrate. But Olympic weightlifting, um, it, you pretty much half a kilo. If, if you're uh, about to weigh in and you know you're more, then you know you're more than half a kilo over, um, get ready to be told. <laughs> well, you you can hop in there and lose it. Yes, you can put your sauna suit. Not only sit in the sauna, but put your sauna suit as well. Recently, we just had someone in Queensland. They'd stopped sweating. They'd stop uh, um, in no saliva whatsoever, and they still didn't make weight. And essentially. Um, and that's a dangerous place to be. Right? As well, too. Blood pressure, again, come, becomes the issue. But people in their 20s do have strokes. It's, yes, it is a uh, condition mostly related with um, those with chronic conditions uh, in, a, in our later uh, parts of our life, but people, young people do have strokes, and, anybody, and with deaths occur in our 20s and 30s by having these type of activities. So the best strategy is to, you know, if you've got a competition that's coming up in three months' time and you, lose, you want to lose, work out your maximum weight loss of about half to one kilo per week and work backwards, am I going to lose and, and where do you come to that uh, half to one kilo? Because we know that any faster than that, you're losing muscle tissue. I see. Beyond that speed of weight loss, you're essentially losing more muscle than, than actual uh, Fat, really. Okay, so essentially, what you're aiming for when you're weight loss, you're looking for fat loss. You're not looking for uh, body loss. Uh, yes, we like to see that scale, but a more effective form of uh, well, we, you do sit on a set scale in a sport like Olympic weightlifting. You, you have to stand on the scales. But, Sometimes naked. And I've done that before. <laughs> Very <laughs> first batch. There's Tony. Drop them, Pete. Because <laughs> 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 it's only 100 grams. And I say, well, okay, there you go. So you do it sometimes. But that's the nature of Olympic sport now with these new categories. You want to be right at that top level now. So if you're in an 89 kilo uh, class, you want to be 88.9 uh, kilos. If you're 88, well, if you're 89.01, then you drop the DAX. And, get yourself because there's no advantage being lighter in the sport where now. in the past there mm. was an advantage yes. a so, long time ago yeah. so nowadays you just you want to be on that number so essentially two kilos above your, your um, what you want you're going to compete at and then you'll lose those last two kilos that week as I said essentially your natural um, level of higher uh, anticipation because of the sport coming on, you'll lose those couple of kilos. Yes, it will be mostly water, but your body, can, you'll still be able to hop on those scales and then rehydrate yourself quickly and you'll be back performing as good as you. And then you've got that, you're on, you're, now you're performing, you've got that uh, um, 
that le uh, uh, level of anticipation, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, your hormone levels just jump up so much that you're just going to perform anyway. You can, yeah. yeah, adrenaline. High adrenaline, yeah. sorry. Uh, you should expect a good 10% above your P, uh, one PB that you've ever done in, a, in, a, in, a, in your uh, training camp just by you're on that platform in front of an audience and your adrenaline is just going through the roof and bang. You wonder, why don't I do that every week? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm just going to summarize what we've quickly gone through. If So for me, I'm an 81 kilo weightlifter. That means that I've got a plan uh, about a week out to be about 83 kilos. That's correct. Now, let's say, one, I weigh 77 kilos at the moment, and my competition is nationals in October, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, or I weigh 85 kilos and same competition. So for those two things, I've got to first figure out uh, early on where my natural body weight is going to stay and if you've been training for a certain period of time you could probably find that pretty yeah, easily yeah, exactly um, if you don't know that however uh, how do you recommend people find that just by training and and yeah just so just look tidy your eating habits up yeah tidy them up looking at and what, we're going to go through how you tidy yeah, them yeah, up yeah, after yeah. yeah so let's take the, so you're now you're trying to find out what your body naturally likes to be at where uh, where it's comfortable so we'll talk about that in a moment but essentially tidy your eating habits up and then see where your body likes to sit once you find that point now that you're looking at about three months you really want to be sitting about three months training and eating on a just a nice pattern where you yep. tidy it up and find out where it sits now you've got about a five kilo um, drop. You can go, go about five kilos below that. We can bring that down. That's over five weeks. Uh, or I probably so you only have to drop. So if you want to lose five kilos for an off, you only actually have to actively lose three. Yeah. So you could actually start four weeks out, and say to yourself, I need to lose three kilos over the next four weeks. I should end up that two kilos above that week before, and then we can lose that last two kilos. Simply, as I mentioned, just naturally your body is anticipation and your appetite will depress naturally. So, um, so you're working, uh, you want to hit that two kilo mark above your competition weight a week out. So you can lose half to one if you, by just simply tidying your eating habits up, you find out where, uh, but we want to find out where you actually sit first. That's where yeah. you want to go. And, and then, we, then we look at the competition. Okay, if I do, if I go down the body weight category, who am I competing against? Do I need to actually go up body weight category? So it's, uh, and now um, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Sorry. Yeah. So but, do we need to go down or yeah, up yeah, body yeah, weight category? So but oh, okay, it's essentially, when you're losing weight, you can't hypertrophy. You can't do two two things at once so you if you're going to lose body weight you have to realize you're not going to get stronger at that point you're saying to yourself okay this is what I'm lifting now and that's what I'm, I'm going to compete in about a month's time once you start trying to lose weight for a change in body weight category you're not going to get stronger so you have to decide maybe I might go put it put off that next competition I might put that competition next one I'm aiming for another four months down the track so I can get that body weight down, set it, and then re go into a hypertrophy mode where you can gain strength. You might gain one or two kilos, but we can keep your body weight stable at the weight you want to be, and then hypertrophy. So you can't do both at the same time. So once you said yourself, I'm going to go down body weight category, you're not going to get stronger. So if you think if by actually dropping a body weight, you might become more competitive in that group, well, actually, you mightn't be because you're not in, you're not being able to get stronger to get to meet in that category. So that's just something to think, be thinking about when you want to change body weight category. Yes, you competit your com fellow competitors, but you're not going to be any stronger. You can't improve your strength training while you're losing weight. It doesn't work. So, um, so we yeah, find out where you want to be set where we want to go to but then where do we set our competitions after that so it's a sequence of events so it might be a 12-month journey just to find out where you sit where do we want to get our strength to what you need to be lifting to be competitive within that certain uh, body weight category and that takes time hmm. yeah, so we think it so like you um, 
So my, my goal is 2021. That's what I'm aiming for. So, but I've got every year to Tokyo. work. Tokyo. Yeah, Tokyo in the World Masters. Now. That's, I want to be on the podium. That's, yeah. where, that's what I'm working towards. It's a long journey. It's been an eight-year journey so far. So I, I consider myself at the same type of process as, as an elite athlete. Essentially, you, somebody's in their 13 and 14-year-olds and they're taking up the sport. They're not looking to be at an Olympic level for another good uh, eight or so years as well, at, the, at a strength uh, training sport, at least anyway. Um, I was hoping to retire at 2012, but my coach says, no, Pete, you'll just be peaking then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> so, so, but that's what I said to myself I, when I started this journey, okay, what is it going to take me to start off being realistic and doing this sport, but where do I want to go? What's my long journey? And I try to say that to most individuals, yeah, what's your goals? Where do you want to go? And we have short goals, medium goals. Uh, another personal model I have, what's your five year, 10 year and 20 year plan in life? We should all have a 20 year plan. Okay, where do you want to be in 20 years? Some sort of gui- rough guideline yeah. to... Yeah. You can put anything in your 20 year plan. Okay, But what do you got to do over the next year, five years, 10 years to make it realistic that you're going to be uh, there in, in a 20 year plan? And that can change. You might have come across that first five years and say, I realize, well, that, that 20 year goal, uh, yeah. It might change and you do something else then. But that drives us, I think, for all of us. And I think that's important that we all have a process by which we grow and develop and, and do things. A lot of us tend to just run around in circles. And I think sport's a really good way for any adult to just give you a focus in life. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about, you, you actually mentioned it before, but like in competition um, nutrition? Well, essentially, you really. Uh, your carbohydrate now is the most, in competition, um, important nutrient is your carb, your carbohydrate. So we're talking right after weighing, we've, we've weighed in fine. So liquid forms, okay, so on the day, then you want everything quick, uh, liquidy, uh, easy to travel, um, uh, and something that's not going to make you sick. So, so like baby food. Ba- well, you are right. And in fact, um, just your basic baby uh, custards or that has a protein content, but still got starch in it, or your, your fruits, your baby fruits. Best option out there, and I'll often take uh, athletes when we go shopping, have a look at the baby food store. Uh, because quick uh, release cans, small serving sizes, you're not wasting much. Um, uh, inexpensive low salt um, and easy to eat because you eat. don't feel like eating because when you. your tum's upset that's it, right you want something that's just going to empty out of the stomach quickly and starches do that um, it, it, as an aside uh, the digestive tract works you empty the stomach from the starches first then the protein and then the fat so essentially if you're having something that's very high starchy um, you find that you might be hungry again an hour or so later but if you're having something that's quite fatty it tends to keep you satisfied now fatty is not really where we want most people to go because essentially it promotes weight gain so we try to find a combination of all three calorie based foods your starch your protein and your and your animal and your fat and we'll talk about that uh, in the short there when we look at how foods sit in our day-to-day eating habits but on the day you've weighed in uh, you want to get that hydration you want to get that uh, carb rebuilt as quickly as possible um, as we mentioned baby foods sports drinks there's a lot of them out there as well you just you like know, Gatorade Gatorade and Powerade Maximum therefore they're all fine it, there's essentially a, a good hit of carb a, a good amount of salt so and that's important to improve the absorption rate having if you're drinking straight water ironically it can actually be more dehydrating than anything so essentially you've just weighed in you want to bring rehydrate yourself not don't drink water actually that you want sports drinks you want food liquidy based foods and can you explain the mechanism for that essentially the kidneys because when you have a high level of electrolytes and and protein substances in a liquid environment your body tends to absorb that through the small intestine very quickly when it's basically a fluid with a lower level of sodium and electrolytes your body then just tends to pass that fluid straight into the large bowel it also, and you, so you've got that method, and also kick, the kidneys tend to kick in and actually flush the system. It's just seeing this big influx of fluid. It doesn't know what to do with it, and would much rather just get rid of it. So you tend to just pass it straight through the kidneys anyway. Yeah. So when, but when you've got a digestive process occurring, now we've got, it slows down that absorption, and you actually get to keep that fluid in the inter and intracellular level. 
So you're hydrate, you're well hydrating yourself. We've got in the cell and we've got around the cell. We want to hydrate both areas, and essentially by allowing your body or making your body having to do having to do a level digestion process that brings that nutrition, that fluid back into the holding it in the body rather than just releasing it straight into the kidneys where it just says, well, let's let's just pass it out. Do you know what the time frame is for these sort of absorptions well, and things? Uh, no, I don't know. But you, you often find if you have a big glass of water, you want to go to the bathroom pretty next 15, 20 minutes, you know you're going to be needing to urinate. Yeah. When you tend to eat enough food, you find that might be a, long, a lot longer, hours as such. And so essentially you, you've weighed in, you've got two hours of competition, you don't want to be spending that time, well you've probably only got an hour, you don't, you don't want to be spending that time in the bathroom, you want to be out there ready doing your stretching, ready to do your warm-ups and, and not having any urge. And that's the bowels as well too, important part about having vegetables, you want, you want to go into a competition with empty bowels. So both both an empty bowel and, a, and a empty uh, kidneys as well, and you don't want to be you don't want that stimulation. So, not drinking water to, as a way of hydrate. Yes, any other day of the week, you still are going to get a level of hydration, but you just don't want you want to you want to depress the need for the kidneys to actually kick in and, and urinate. And why is that? Oh, just because you don't want bowel movements. Yeah, while you're, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you just don't want bowel movements. bowel. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it's a, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good. We don't talk about our bowel habits. You don't. We're all happy to around the, sit around the dinner table talking about our blood pressure. We're all happy to talk about what medication we're taking. We're all happy to talk about the local hair hairdressers, but we don't talk about how well we poo. And we're very. It's a socially, unex, still a socially unacceptable uh, subject. And essentially, two good bowel evacuations every day. And I was having a joke with Andrew and the team just recently, but essentially the toilet's not a place of entertainment. <laughs> we, essentially, we should have an, a need. A, a, the body is telling us it needs to defecate. And if possible, we should be able to uh, uh, source out a toilet and, and be able to empty our bowels, get in and get out. Sometimes it's inconvenient to go to the toilet, so we have a means by which we can prevent ourselves going to the toilet. And we just hold on and, and, and we can do that once, twice, that's okay, but if we do that too often, a lot of kids tend to do that. Kids get, de uh, get constipation because they hold on and that the uh, stool dries out and it becomes uh, even more difficult for the body to pass. But anyway, I'm digressing a little bit, but essentially um, keeping our bowels healthy is a very uh, important part of our performance in sport. We just don't need to have an upset tummy. Uh, elite athletes that do travel the world, it's a significant problem because you're living outside the normal environment, your normal um, environment, not only in terms of physical, but also environmental, the, um, especially the type of bacteria and um, just the cleanliness around us. And, so, and you're not used to that, your body's just not used to those type of uh, my, uh, microorganisms and that can give us upset tummies. So it's important when you're traveling, when you're away, even when you're traveling into states, wash your hands, keep yourself clean. Before you put your hands into your, touching your face, wash your hands. Don't the drink the tap water. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us, yeah, that was a little joke from last week too, someone was saying. Yeah, drink, oh, that's why I don't know who said it. Yeah, drinking, uh, using bottled water uh, that's sealed. Um, it's, it's, yes, everywhere, even if you're going to the States, I would still just buy your own bottled water uh, because you're just not used to the type of uh, microorganisms that are in that room and so you want to keep yourself clean. You don't need to be wearing, uh, you don't, uh, surgical bus or <laughs> you're going to, there's bacteria around us everywhere. But essentially just being sensible about personal hygiene when you're traveling and just because you just don't want to be having any form of diarrhea the day before um, you're about to lift. And I think you'd be surprised at how many athletes actually have to deal with that in competition. All the time. Uh, because we don't think about it. It's, it's essentially, our, especially boys, we're very poor in hand washing. All of us, interesting little digression we have here. One of the best things we have in uh, any type of sport, and Olympic weightlifting, keep your hands clean. Um, protect your hands and look after your hands, especially for, uh, after calluses uh, as such. Know how to um, lower your calluses and protect them. That's, and that's something else there too. We don't, we just, Chalk up, grab the bar, the bar, and away you go. Pair. 
it's all part of the, the performance is how, how you um, look after your own body. Not only nutrition, uh, but cleanliness as well too. Now, we've talked about in competition. Was there anything else you wanted to add to in competition? Uh, well, essentially on the day, you, if, you've, if you've got a more, okay, I suppose if, if you're having a morning session, you've had a nice full meal the night before, um, depending on your weight. If you're still a bit worried about your um, weight the next day, probably say your three o'clock meal in the afternoon and make that your last meal of the day. That should carb up, having a nice nourishing meal, and that should still carry you through to the next day. If you're having an after lunch weigh-in, um, you should still be able to manage an early morning meal. So a lot of people just don't like eating at seven o'clock in the morning or that type of hours. So it takes a bit of training. So while, while you're in part of the training, learning how to, sometimes you might have to eat that first meal of the day at an early stage, just so you can nourish yourself there. But you've got the option of liquid foods then too. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a solid based food in the first thing in the morning. It doesn't have to be uh, scrambled eggs on toast. Um, you can still do a milkshake. You can still do something that's yogurt with a little bit of fruit. Just something that's gonna give you a nice little bit of hit of, a little bit stronger hit of carbohydrate first in the morning. And then sit, monitor your weight for the next couple of hours, see, see how it's traveling. And if you can hit it's about two hours out, or wait, get yourself weighed in and then you can carb up again. So I would, so if you're having an early morning meal, lift an evening meal, uh, about, it would be better if you didn't have to be worried about your weight. If you're, you're bang on Friday afternoon, you're lifting Saturday morning, your evening meal, have a, have a mid, five, early meal, you know, five yeah. o'clock, okay? You should be able to manage that full meal and still weigh in quite nicely in the morning. If and that means you can go to the toilet in the morning. And, as, and as well too, you can, and you're likely to do that as well. Most of us do have a morning um, uh, poop pollution. schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's two o'clock in the afternoon as well. <laughs> <laughs> two o'clock I know something's going to happen well how how many de- uh, times a day twice a day <laughs> and essentially two good bowel evacuations essentially you should feel as though you've emptied yourself you should feel that yes I have been how often we get that sense that oh, just doesn't quite feel I've emptied everything out and you're wondering whether I should just get up and go or you do get up and go and all of a sudden oh I've got to go back to the toilet again no you should be able to say to yourself I can move, move my bowels I've emptied them and, and I've finished the job. A lot of people that might have um, GI problems, chronic like uh, Crohn's, colitis or uh, irritable bowel, it's a perpetual problem for them. Essentially, you never get that sense of, I've emptied my bowels and I feel like I'm built nice and light. I'm sure there's a lot of other ways people put it. But, but, that's but it's a great feeling. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. And I, and I laugh, you know, how do you put it across that sense without being too, uh, that, you know, sense. It's, a, it's a normal habit, which will all be passing. So, and unfortunately, a lot of people think if I go Monday, Wednesday and Friday, and I've been doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday for the last 20 years, it's normal. Well, in fact, that's not the case at all. Um, every day, with our bowels. we don't pass enough quantity of bowel uh, stool. Um, uh, it's something like... Uh, 300 grams or a little bit more uh, a day, we're only pa- passing barely 100 grams, so less than a third of what our normal bowel output should be. And uh, I, I mentioned this term this week, uh, our mouth to anus transit time. How long does it take for our body to digest food and then remove the waste? Essentially, we're seeing something like three to four days of a process happening we're looking at, we should be looking at about one to two, well, a day or so. And well. we do have a simple fix for that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and what we're really, the basic, if there's one thing we really want you to take home um, today is essentially let's get our vegetables happening. And that's uh, one of the biggest messages I'm out there trying to teach, even for elite power lifters, uh, hypertrophy. Even that any strength athlete any strength or any athlete, athlete, any athlete, and everyday type of eating patterns is that we're not focusing on our uh, vegetable intake. Do we want to move on to that? Maybe? Um, oh. One last thing. All right, we'll get, we're kind of moving yep. all over the place. We've done in competition. Mm. Can we talk about post competition quickly? Well, okay. Well, because mine's usually a beer, and I don't think it's exactly. the exactly. <laughs> you know, you've just trained for maybe four months. <laughs> You've been really conscious about what you've been doing. You've made your weight. You've done well in the competition. Hell, now go and enjoy yourself. Have a week. And in fact, you should have everybody having uh, with that week off. Okay, that doesn't give you license to be gluttonous. <laughs> it, it gives you license to be a little bit of freer. 
and then you have that. And then over a week, you're not going to deteriorate your, the level. Of, you, you notice that if you're not trained for two or three weeks, it's, you lose a lot of conditioning very quickly. We lose conditioning very, very quickly. But over a week, we can afford to drop that little bit of conditioning and enjoy ourselves. It's that reward. It's the enjoyment of all that work you've just put into it. Um, even for a paid elite Australian representative has a holiday. They're allowed to have that moment past the major competition where they go out. Yeah, some of them overdo it. <laughs> some of them get into some trouble. <laughs> uh, and, and, and of course, you, when you're taking a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, and you've just been flogging them to death for the sport for the last year or so, and they've achieved the pinnacle of an Olympics, it sometimes can be uh, let loose. And, but we see that week to week in other sports, though, too, don't we? <laughs> Anyway, so essentially for all of us, having that little bit of time off where we can enjoy a few beers, uh, have the occasional uh, takeaway, uh, enjoy, and gather with your friends. Um, and say thank you to them because for you as an individual, as an athlete, it takes a team to get you there. Okay? 100%. And, all right, you just didn't do this by yourself. There's people that go out of their way to make sure that you have the opportunity to achieve that uh, thing. And they're the unsung heroes. They're the people that just don't get the TV interviews and. The, uh, their names in the paper, but they're the, they're the important people to allow that in one individual. Um, so it's a big uh, responsibility for an elite athlete because they do carry the uh, aspirations for a lot of people around them. They want that individual to succeed and they don't want them being coming home and making a fool of themselves after an event. But yeah, so post post. You can add to, I would still think you still want to have a basic uh, concept of good eating habits, but then you add to it. So that extra glass of wine, that extra beer, that takeaway meal, that, ta that, um, that unusual food that you've not um, tried before. And because if you get sick from it, at least you're not going to, it's not going to interfere with your training schedule. You're not, you're not going to let down 100, 25 million Australians because, oh, I can't compete because I'm sick. Uh, you've, you've already done the competition, you've, you've done the accolades, you've received the rewards. If something you do in terms of food happens to give you a gut upset, well, okay, just go and hide for a day or two. We don't need to know about it. <laughs> just don't be found on this. <laughs> <laughs> that went dark real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, be sensible. <laughs> there is, anyway. You told so, me an interesting story downstairs about you were at a, a, a dinner and a, a child was very confused at your plate. Can you tell us that again? Because I thought that was really funny. Can you remind me of that? Uh, about they looked at your plate, saw the colours on it. Oh, oh, they, oh just, what, uh, yeah, what, just I, what I just told you this morning, yeah. actually. Um, part of uh, being an athletes is sometimes you have to take up employment just we still have bills to be to be uh, to pay and so I was just working in a factory with a significant level of um, Islander ladies and some of them quite large uh, girls and I was sitting as you do with them with a factory the boys sit on one table and the girls sit on another table and I was eating just a uh, nondescript salad and this is the story you were yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it was fed back to me, no pun intended, that, that <laughs> one of the ladies on that table thought I was eating a bowl of lollies. <laughs> it had come to us by that this individual had not seen a food that had any colour about it, or only, only thought of food that had colour as a confectionery. And it, it was an interesting insight to sometimes... Uh, how people don't have a knowledge of food that's appropriate. They tend to have inappropriate... Um, well, that's how they've been exposed to food. And that, that, that's individual thought I was eating for lunch a box of sweets. Hadn't the concept of that being a salad just didn't cross that individual's mind. So I'm out there trying to reflect the importance, not our vegetables, what they are, how we can use them, how convenient they can be. Uh, and a very important part of our everyday diet that's really lacking. Um, I think the last survey we had less than 5% of the Australian population reaches the recommended five serves of vegetables a day. Five for women, six for men actually. 
a serving. Yeah, yeah. So it was essentially, yeah. The, um, that was my yeah. attempt at a good segue. So, yeah, segue so coming across. <laughs> very good. No, no. So we're coming across. So, so what we have in front of us is the current um, visual training aid of when you look at a meal. How do, how does that meal fit as a healthy? Um, how a well balanced. Let's not say the word healthy, but let's say the word as a balanced meal. And the current and what I've got in front of me and what I'm showing Andrew is a, a plate model. Uh, and in the past, what was the where model? We used to we? have the pyramid. So, so we still have what's called, we have our food groups, and that, that's what's still uh, taught at schools. So and what are the food groups? And for so we have our have. Uh, breads and cereals, fruit and veg, meat, dairy, fats, and oils. And that's the five. And alcohol. That's, not, <laughs> <laughs> that's the extra. So <laughs> we put out an extra. But it doesn't, that we found that just didn't serve a means by promoting a representation of what sits on the table itself at the end of the day we can we can uh, group foods together but when you look at a meal uh, what's a better way of giving us an edu- of, a, of, a, of a training model model and so the, the powers that be have come up with what's called the plate model and for most of us out there I'm sure you've seen uh, the idea and if you hop on any uh, website and just ask for a plate model uh, uh, you'll find you'll come up with a, a round plate Obviously, most plates are. <laughs> and divided into three uh, sections in, into a veg, fruit, I should actually say vegetables and fruit rather than fruit and vegetables, uh, uh, meat and then uh, starchy foods as well. So into three components. So you still have the five food groups, but sitting on a plate, we look, identify them as three groups. But ironically, we see that when you look at the plate, half the plate is filled with our coloured, non-calorie based vegetables. A quarter of our plate is filled with our uh, protein foods, usually of an animal uh, base, but we can include our non-animal protein foods, nuts, being, uh, nuts and legumes as an example. And then a third a quarter of the, uh, another quarter of the plate is our starchy foods. So we've got up the top there, our vegetables and fruit, our meat, protein and our carbs. So that's when you're looking at a meal, what constitutes a balanced meal, a meal. But we're looking at balancing our entire food intake throughout the day. So it's also um, promoting that the idea that if I was to gather everything I ate in a day and I put it on this table, I might say that half the table is vegetables and fruit, a quarter of the table is your protein, and a quarter of the table is come. So it's still promoting that idea that when you look at your entire daily intake, most of your intakes should still be vegetables and fruit. Because this is kind of very easy to do at dinner time. We like the meat. It adds flavour. It's relative. There's a cost, but we can get cheaper options. Um, It tends to... uh, It's the more of the appealing part of the meal is the protein. It's the fat that comes with it. And that's the the aroma. That's what gives the mouthfeel. That's what gives the texture. and we can eat a lot of it because we, we can just keep eating. We've, we've kind of forgotten the idea that when your body tells you... Hey, satiety. No, satiety. <laughs> satiety. We should stop. But, but there's still more on that plate. And, that's, and you only have to go back a generation or so that said you don't leave the table until you finish the plate. And that's still very much a common uh, mindset. For and it comes from a place of scarcity. Yes. Right? But essentially we don't have to waste food. We, if we've got food still on the plate, that can be put aside and we can eat it at, at another time. And that was one of the recommendations. So for those that don't know, we had a really cool evening last week where we talked about a lot of these things, talked about coaching, talked about businesses and all of that. Um, A bunch of coaches got together here Mm. downstairs. And one of the cool things that you really recommended was the the positive benefits of leftovers for breakfast. Yes. (laughs) And, And we don't have an individual at home who, as a permanent home entity that does the cooking, the cleaning, and allowing the household to work effectively. So we've lost that ability to have a morning meal because no one's out there cooking it for us. So a lot of us tend to go for quick and easy, uh, pre-prepared type of dishes. And and the vast majority of us when we think of breakfast is usually a cereal because we don't have to do much with it. Add a bit of milk and then put it in a bowl and away you go. But I don't mind thinking about leftovers as an option a couple of days a week as well, just to change up that type of, um, we, we will talk a little bit more in depth about why the three fruit foods, but essentially when we think of breakfast cereals, we're generally dealing with a meal that has a fair level of refinement. 
tends to be a fairly energy dense type of meal, it tends to be fairly salty and doesn't tend to be very satiating. It tends to stimulate the appetite for further in the morning. Morning tea comes along the, tr the local truck or the, the whatever food that might be available in the local fridge. We go searching and we, we don't tend to want to search for uh, um, a piece of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to like to search for... The tea the, and biscuits. The, the finger buns a and the scones <laughs> and there's something that's going to go with a cup of tea. And it's available. Yeah, days gone past, we don't need to snack, ladies and boys and girls. We've just learnt how to snack because we've got time and food industry just said, oh, you're not doing anything for three hours, let's make something so you can <laughs> do it. It was three square meals a day. It's really what it's about. Eating a meal in the morning that's satiating enough that should get you right through to lunch, a midday meal that's satiating enough that should get you through the evening meal. But we snack for breakfast, we have a light lunch, and then three o'clock in the afternoon comes along and Hungry Bear sets in. And once the Hungry Bear sets in, then there's nothing stopping you. They're raiding the cupboard and, and uh, you're going to eat then and then overeat at dinner and then snack later at night time. And then the consequence of that tends to be you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry. So we snack again and snack and uh, round and round we go. So we're essentially eating a lot, a lot of our energy dense, high calorie based foods late in the afternoon, going to bed with a, f uh, uh, well, a high level of food that needs to digest. I think half the sleeping problems we suffer is because the body's trying to digest the food and you're trying to go to sleep and wondering what all this noise is about. And your gut's trying to go <laughs> and trying to eat food. No, eating that last meal about five o'clock in the afternoon and then going to bed about that nine o'clock. We've had that time to have that digest. But that's in a, in, just impractical in our society today. But having a, for all of us, having that first meal, thinking about it, a little bit more attention to detail and that kind of sets us up with a reasonable possibility of reducing our calorie intake late, later at night. Okay. Um, that's a good thing. I do want to go back to breakfast and stuff, but I think we should come yep. back to the topic that we were talking right. about. Um, t talk about these different food groups so and the importance of them for right. athletes and even just regular people. Well, carbohydrate, let's start off with our major important for sports people is starch, sugar, Carbohydrates, it's all exactly the same thing. It's glucose, breaks down to glucose, and our body then uh, digests it into the bloodstream and we transport it into the muscle and we call that um, glycogen. And so we store it as glycogen in the muscles. And then your body, once it goes into the muscle tissue, it's a one way process. We can't then take, if, the, if we needed to use it somewhere else outside the muscle tissue, it's a one way process. Once it's in the muscles, it's there. Uh, we won't go any further with that subject. So essentially, uh, carb, we need to be providing that on a, a regular basis throughout the day. About a three, hour, three to four hour spacing is a good, pro, a good level of uh, spread. Carbohydrate or starchy based foods, I identify under three major headings. Grain based foods, legume based foods, and tuber based foods. Now grains, Typically, we're a wheat-based society. A lot of our grain-based foods are manufactured from wheat. But we're like living in a country that has access to the vast majority of grains. Not only do we have wheat, but we also have rice, we have corn, we have oats. There's still barley out there. It's not a typical grain food that we consume. Millets out there, um, rye. An old grain used to be around in the 90s. It was called triticale. A lot of us might... Uh, Remember that there was a hybrid between rye and wheat. It does not not as available. I don't see it anymore. Never heard of it. No, nah, pretty <laughs> um, We talk. What's current in the media in terms of grain are the so-called um, ancient grains. Uh, Athlamas, I think, is one. Uh, spelt as well, essentially. Not as energy dense. Not as high in their carbohydrate content as like your common grains that we have today. So is that better, worse? Well, essentially, if you're looking for an energy value to do sport, it's not really going to. It's good if you got if you get bowel upsets. Uh, a lot of people use it because it has a lower level of uh, carb, uh, easier on the gut to use. Um, as far as it being an ancient grain, well, grains have only been around for ten thousand years. That's it. So essentially, whether it's wheat, rice, corn, or oat, they're all a good range of options we have out there. The odd thing about wheat is that you can't boil it up and eat it. Unlike rice, corn, oats, barley, rye, every other grain, there's a process of simply boiling it, it becomes edible. Wheat doesn't do that. It's a very hard husk on the outside. 
So the only way we can really consume wheat is by milling it. And for the vast majority of foods that we use a mill wheat product, we tend to take out a high level of that, that husk. We lose the fibre content. And we end up with a nice white endosperm, that flour. It cooks, it rises, it tastes, it takes butter quite well. And so you it takes <laughs> butter quite well. <laughs> that's your row <laughs> and sugars. So it combines with those ingredients very easily. And what do you end up with? Is your biscuits, your cakes, your chocolates, your breakfast cereals as well too. Because you, can, you have to, when you're dealing with wheat, mill it. Yeah. And we change the, the profile. So unlike your other, yes, with rice we polish, we do lose the fibre content there, but you can buy a, a brown rice. And in fact, if, if at home I'll usually buy a 500, uh, a five uh, kilo bag of white uh, basmati rice and a one kilo bag of uh, brown rice and I'll mix it at that ratio. So I just bring the fibre content up a little bit, but it cooks and looks and tastes like white rice. And That's so, so smart. And you just throw it in your white rice cooker and away you go. So you just buy that habit. You just buy the two together, a large quantity of one or the other, mix the two together and you can do rice on a real regular basis. Now you're not living in Vietnam. You're not living in a uh, Asian culture where you have to have rice breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but it can be part of a regular weekly habit. 20, think about three meals I was raised on rice. Yes. That, um, <laughs> yes. But, and it's a very poo-pooed grain. No pun intended, there, but essentially, <laughs> uh, but if you were living in an Asian culture, you'd have this little bowl of rice, a tiny little bit of meat, and a big serving of a vegetable content with it. Well, this plate's saying that we should be doing the other. Oh, well, and that's exactly what this plate is actually telling us. But we tend to westernise the type of eating habit where the, the, the protein and the carb become the main part of the meal and the vegetable becomes a, uh, it's, it's, it's a background component where it should be the main part every meal. So carbohydrates, firstly grains, wheat, rice, corn and oats. Uh, legumes, they're the beans, uh, red kidney beans, chickpeas, navy beans, cannellini beans, they're a good source of carbohydrate. Yes, they do cross over into the protein food as well, but they're not a complete protein. So essentially you need to manipulate, your, if you're thinking about uh, protein foods as you're vegetarian or vegan, we need to combine our legumes with other forms of non uh, animal based, uh, protein based foods to get a complete protein. Nuts work quite nicely, but as a carb food, they're perfectly fine. And then a third major source of carbohydrates, tubers, and they're your root, uh, starchy root vegetables. So potato, yes, we're typical. In fact, potato is the only vegetable that we're still increasing our consumption on a year after year or year, but it comes about because of takeaway foods. But potato, uh, sweet potato, uh, yam we know of, we're aware of that. But taro is out there too, very islander-based um, uh, root vegetable, quite large, like a bowling ball, in fact, very hairy on the outside. A little bit more work. A lot of, yes. <laughs> and so you really would need to know how, what to do with it. Um, and certainly I'm not an expert on that particular root vegetable. Very hard, it's not a normal Coles, Woolworths, Aldi type of brand of vegetable you're gonna find in their uh, vegetable selection. You really have to know where they are. Uh, sure enough, if you wanna give it a go, I recommend it, write back to me and <laughs> talk about it. Uh, so we've got, so in terms of carbs, our major food options are grains, legumes and tubers. What's unique about Australia's food supply is that we have all of those things. You can be up in Caratha in Western Australia, you know that you can get rice and corn and sweet potato. You can be down in Sejuna in South Australia, know you're going to get baked beans, red kidney beans. And you can be down in Strawn in, in, um, in Tasmania and know you're going to get um, barley and rye. Um, and bread. So right across this entire continent, what makes Australia's food uh, supply the envy of the world is the fact that we have access to all of these uh, staples, carbohydrate. But we're very much limited in our food choices in Australia. A lot of us, when we think of breakfast, we're a cereal-based society, so we're very much a wheat-based option in the morning. We tend, we tend to our work, our school, our uh, habits around the midday meal tend to be a bread-based, whether it's a loaf or a flat bread or cracker of sorts, we tend to be very much a wheat there society. Yeah, some of us are eating other things, but essentially we're still major bread intake there. And then at night time, we're still very much a potato-based society. Yes, we do eat potato, um, sorry, um, rice at night time, but still for the vast majority of us, uh, good uh, most probably five to six nights a week, we'd still be having a potato-based 
meal. That doesn't lead us down the path of having good variety in our eating habits. One of the first dietary guidelines is to enjoy a variety of foods. Three days wheat bix, two days just right, and three days fiber blast for breakfast is not variety. What? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> we're having that same form of carbohydrate, wheat based, generally. So, <laughs> and whether it's flat, white, or wholemeal, it's still bread. What about sourdough? It's, it's, <laughs> it's still a refined grain. <laughs> and then uh, at night time, your potato. So, what I so when I'm looking at an individual's eating habits, how can we get a little bit more variety first? How can we have a little bit of a change around in the general uh, form of uh, carbs? The point about that is essentially you tend to reduce the amount of refinement. And when you're dealing with a, a, a cereal based uh, that's, that's wheat, you're always dealing with a level of refinement. And that always, that's the point I'm making, is that there's always a level of refinement. It wouldn't hurt us to try and have some food selections in our in our week to week eating habits where we're trying to re have something that has a little less refinement about it. And no refinement, in fact. Corn, sweet potato, your legumes, they can sit quite nicely in our eating habits as a way of just jazzing up our eating habits. What was the, what was the, t the way I was saying it before? Not cleaning it up, uh, but just um, when we started out in our talk today. Oh, no, it might have been there. But essentially just <laughs> jazz jazzing it up a bit by having a little less refinement. And we can do that by looking at our starch. Animal foods, well, we generally do the, we, we are pretty good at trimming using low fat cooking methods. The Heart Foundation's been at us for quite a number of decades now, so they trim the fat, uh, use low fat cooking methods, grill. Uh, and so I don't really need to go too much in terms of the low fat type of message because that's been out there for a long time. And, and as a dietitian for nearly three years, uh, 30 years of experience, well, that's well ingrained. It really has taken on, uh, uh, people have taken that message on quite well. Probably a little too much in some cases. Yes, you're quite right there too. Being a, that's, uh, especially for your young athletes, it's not, and I'm talking about your uh, pre adolescence or just coming that age, that's not time to be on a low fat diet. Essentially, the hormonal changes that, we, uh, that are happening, your body growths and um, your maturity that's happening requires quite a decent serve of uh, fat in their diet. And your body's quite active, it's quite met metabolically uh, um, mobile, so essentially having that extra fat content, you're not likely to uh, increase a body fat storage. It's more the carb that's the problem. Trying to, again, for kids, trying to get a little bit more variety in their eating habits, bring down that level of refinement. But what really is l limited in our eating habits is our vegetables. We're really not carrying enough vegetable content uh, per se. And every uh, health um, department in our Western world, from the States to Canada to England, Australia, New Zealand, recommends a serving of at least five serves of vegetables uh, for women and six for men. What equates to a serve? Half a cup cooked or one cup of cal uh, salad. So we're looking for us to try to, if we're looking at just cook non-starchy vegetables, three cups of coloured vegetables per day. Now we barely make two, and if you take potatoes out, we only make one. So if there's one, the second, well I'd, say, I'd actually t say that's a more primary requirement in our eating habits to increase our vegetable intake than changing the type of vegetables. My argument why we don't get enough vegetables Essentially, if you look at the type of carbs that we use, breakfast cereals are not a dish that's conducive to carrying vegetables. I'm not about to try and convince the population to have a side salad with a bowl of breakfast. <laughs> so when we look at that type of staple, that carb that we're having as a morning meal, it kind of inhibits. Not only are we getting that level of refinement, we tend to be inhibiting the uh, opportunity to have a vegetable value. So that's why leftovers tend to carry vegetables quite well, because at night time we have some vegetables. Sandwiches could be a great carry of a salad or vegetables, but a typical filling of a sandwich tends to be ham and cheese, a bit of tomato if you're lucky. Why is that? Because we like to hold the sandwich in one hand and keep doing what we're doing. So we tend, a lot of us aren't stopping for lunch. We're not sitting down and relaxing and having that break. Days gone past, you had, the, had a meal and you went home, had a meal and then had a siesta. 
very few countries in the world do that in this day and age. Uh, Spain, you, some countries, European countries still have a siesta. China still has siestas in certain parts of their country. But in, certainly not in Australia. Our work economics uh, don't allow that. And there's a, there, 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 there seems to be, I mean, I know I feel better that if I, if I eat and then just like move around a little bit before I get back to work? Well, you try, there's only so much blood in the system. It can't fill every um, space uh, in the body. So it has to say, are we being active? Right, I need my blood system to go to my muscles. Oh, am I digesting food? Well, I need to take mus uh, blood away from the muscle tissue and move it around and move around the digestive tract. So it's actually, once you've uh, uh, eat a meal, eaten a fairly large, significant meal, now's not the time to do a 10K. Um, oh, no, I wasn't uh, saying yeah. 10K. But being generally walking around, that's okay. I just meant sitting down. But having sit, Sitting down. Well, this is what we call, it's also called the postprandial effect. Essentially, your body has started that digestive process. It's pulled blood away from not only the muscle tissue, but also the brain. So we tend to have a lower oxidated area in the brain, so we get tired. So a good time for a nap. It's a good time to have a nana nap. But it's exactly right. And, and we have done that for millennia, but in our recent uh, modern times, that has gone by and by, because we just want to get that eight hour shift in and get it all over and done with. So a lot of us get very tired. I mean, I was trying to talk, having a business conversation at three o'clock in the afternoon, is fraught with many more more than just the usual conversation uh, barriers that people have being able to hold a conversation, but essentially that mind is now wandering, it's not con hasn't got that level of concentration and such. So don't go and see your bank manager at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> on appointment at eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Hopefully they're fresh. <laughs> <laughs> and they're nourished and they've had breakfast and right now you can back up and then you can argue your point and you've got their attention. So you don't want to be driving, oh, well, we shouldn't be driving heavy machinery at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, scaling large heights that hour now because that's when the mines, if we've eaten, especially if we've eaten, surely if you've eaten something light, you'll get through, that's fine. But essentially if you've had that second well-nourished, significant meal midday, you want to be planning about what you're going to be doing for the rest of the afternoon to keep yourself safe. It is quite an h and issue. Um, I'm an ex-military man and I know it's a, um, uh, it's a chargeable offence not to have breakfast. You, had to have, you, were to, you must have breakfast because the expectation is you are going to do a, a quite dangerous activities and so they, want, they wanted you to be fully attentive. So the importance of having that midday meal could include a vegetable value. So I do encourage you to think about when you're looking at that wrap, can we put a little bit more filling in it just than just the typical protein-based foods? Uh, and take your time, Let have that break, allow yourself to have that full break. And then hopefully, if you've had that good meal for breakfast, at, followed up with a good meal at lunchtime, you should be able to get through to that early, after, early evening meal. Sure enough, we're eating about that eight o'clock and nine o'clock mark now. Just our, so what can we plan as a meal, a lightish meal that's nourishing um, and well balanced and just stave off that hungry bear effect. So again, another sandwich. Um, well, breakfast cereals actually work really well mid-afternoon. Something as quick and easy, having in your office or having um, in, in the environment. As long as you've had that well balanced meal throughout the day, your fast digestible starches can be a nice little stopgap. And I think you recommend that as a perfect post-workout post meal. Post-workout meal, because in here in this environment, you've just done an hour, an hour and a half training. The, the recommendation is a 20 gram uh, content of protein, and then a, and I'll be a bit, I'm going to be technical here, but a one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight serving. So, so if you're taking a 70 kilo, 80 kilo athlete, you're looking at about 70 grams of carbohydrate immediate that 20 minutes or so uh, after a training session. The breakfast cereals work really well on that. But I would actually, to up, bump up the protein content, I'd add a little bit of extra supplement to it there as well. And I like using the skim milk powder. So I, if, if I've got something in the fridge that's in my gym around, just having a jug of, not a jug of milk, but some milk container that I'll actually preempt by putting some uh, extra tablespoons of um, skim milk powder. Let's not be technical here about what's the ratio. If you've got 100 mils, I'd probably one tablespoon for 100 mils. That'd be a nice, that's a easy, it'll, that'll melt in there quite nicely, just a stir. And um, what, what people uh, sometimes don't realise is that skim milk powder is probably one of the safest 
and all I have to do is take something and all of a sudden it's not only me getting the reward but I can bring my parents, I can bring my family, I can bring wealth to my community. That's a, what's a, uh, it's temptation. Well, it's a motivator. It's a motivator, yeah. Whereas a, someone in, in Australia, uh, it's not life and death. Sure enough, it's cost you a lot of money, but essentially... So it's uh, actually getting you to death sooner. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you get into death. But you can find it, usually find a way. If, you, if you're motivated enough, and you're, there's a way. You, you'll find a way. But when you're from a third world country, unless you just happen to be picked in some type of... Uh, you've been noted for your talent, and you've been uh, sought, and the, the country's willing to spend money on you, and you succeed, um, and it's, but it brings great wealth to the, your local community. That can bring a lot of people out of poverty, and, that, and that's a big motive. that's a big temptation. Mm. Sometimes it's not the athlete's call either. Well, again, we think yes. Uh, we know that it, it is a government-sponsored um, drive that their athletes will take these products, and if you don't take them, you're out. You, you don't have a choice, and we saw that certainly through uh, the 50s and 60s. Uh, and it still occurs today, we're seeing that, so state-sponsored uh, doping. Hey guys, watch Icarus if you haven't watched it already. <laughs> have you watched Icarus? No, I can't see that. You haven't no. watched Icarus? Icarus no. Oh, there's a documentary on Netflix I'm not, called yeah, Icarus. No, no, don't, um, don't subscribe. <laughs> One of the things you have to give up when you're saying you want to do a sport is TV and it's a, it's a, a bit of money that you say, well, I can do better with it. <laughs> so, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. So, so when I'm looking at a meal, I'm looking at three components. What's my carb? What's my protein? And can I get my vegetable value in there as well? So I'm always looking at uh, assessing my, I'm always asking myself the question, what's my carb going to be for this meal? If it's, is, is it rice, is it going to be corn, is it going to be... I'm not saying I don't eat bread, but essentially I'm just trying to say what are what some options I could also have. Am I going to put uh, cheese on that bread or am I going to have a little bit of stir-fried beef in my rice? Am I going to serve that with just a, a bag of nondescript peas, beans and carrots in my stir-fry or am I going to do a toss salad? In, in as well? So I'm always trying to work my the idea of... I'm trying to work this model. And that's what this plate model is. It's a, a model of a looking at, when you look at a meal, I'm saying to yourself, can I get those three components, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Now, you don't have to have it in one sitting as well. You can actually have courses. As I mentioned before, this, the plate model is saying to us, what's your entire food intake for the day? If so I it's can, a proportion or percentage-based model. Exactly. So I could still bring everything onto a surface and look at it and say to myself, yes, half of everything I've eaten today was a non-calorie plant-based option. A quarter of it was a form of starch and, and a quarter of it was a protein value. And I just like the idea of spreading that meal throughout the day, spreading the vegetables throughout the day as well. When we talk about fat, it's an energy source that we can t talk in terms of months, if not years, in terms of storage. When we talk about protein, we talk in terms of months, usually. When we talk about carbohydrate, we talk in terms of days. We're not going to fall off this planet tomorrow if you just don't eat anything. You, you can not eat for a month. Uh, you'll survive it. You, it's, not, it's going to hurt you. But most, we, they talk in the army. They talk about the three P's, uh, three, uh, three threes. Uh, uh, you can live for a month without food, but you can only live without water for three days. So essentially, and what's the third three? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I brought that subject. I, mean, I didn't know the complete story, but my mother talks about, about You just have me intrigued. Yeah, now. sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. But essentially, uh, solid foods, that are nutrients, we have a good storage in terms of um, fat. We all know we can store fat. Protein, we're talking in terms of months. Carb, we're talking in terms of days. But vitamins and minerals, and most of our source of vitamins and minerals are from our vegetables, we talk in, can, in fact, talk in terms of hours. A lot of the vitamin and minerals, especially our water-based, uh, are very heat labile. They, tend, they can be either used or uh, sent on its way in terms of hours. We, don't ha we have very poor capacity to store vitamins in any great extent for any great length of time. 
And, and so essentially one of my arguments about why I don't mind us trying to have a spread of vegetables throughout the day, just to hedge your bet, is you're getting that level of vitamin and mineral, mineral content that is available for you throughout the day. Um, and the importance about vitamins and minerals is essentially it allows your body to be more efficient in using its carb and using its protein. So essentially, yes, your protein and your carb, they're substrates. But essentially the catalyst that allows us to use those those uh, substrates more efficiently is the vitamin and mineral content. So by having that good spread of vitamin and minerals throughout the day, your body becomes a little bit more efficient in being able to use vitamins and minerals. Rather than just storing it, let's be active, let's let the body be able to use it efficiently. Um, and vitamins and minerals allow us to do that. So that's why I like to see that breakfast, that midday meal and that evening meal, having a vegetable content allows us that supply of vitamins and minerals right throughout the day. Um, Kidneys are very efficient if we eat too much vitamin and mineral. There's no upper level. Yeah, you just pee it out. You just pee it out. Um, taking supplements, especially vitamin C, you end up with very expensive urine. Yeah, yeah. that bright yellow stuff. Yeah, but because it just, your body doesn't have the capacity to use it. Once you're having an orange a day or an apple, you're generally getting the vast majority of vitamin C straight away. Taking super levels, 1,000 milligrams or more of vitamin C, serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever. Very expensive, and it doesn't reduce, damn, we, we all blame Linus Pauling by this paper he wrote many, many years ago saying vitamin C cures the common cold. Well, it might extend, instead of a cold lasting six days, it might last five days. But essentially, you get a cold, you rest, you drink plenty of water, eat nicely, and let it get out. We don't have a cure for it. So just keep your, wash your hands <laughs> so you don't get it. Um, so, so when I look at a meal, I'm looking for... Is there a, sorry, is there an upper limit to any of these micronutrients? Uh, uh, or like yes. toxicity? To In the normal food supply, no. Once you start taking a supplement form of it, vitamin A is a good example. We, uh, some of the... Um, Explorers in the uh, South Pole, Northern Poles, when they ate their dog's liver, they died of uh, uh, vitamin A toxicity because it's had such a high level. So it's, there are c clinical cases where you've eaten an inappropriate food source or a, a, a level of a supplement that you actually had a, um, a reverse effect. effect. Um, vitamin A is a good one. Most of your, vitamin, most of your fat based vitamins will cause an issue. So uh, if you eat a lot of organ meats, yes, that's a good that's, example. Uh, good source of iron, but essentially you can overdo it. So you don't want to eat organ meats for every day, for every meal? No, it's, it's good to have, no, it's actually, <laughs> no. Good source of iron, yeah, uh, B vitamins, but uh, we don't have to nowadays. You, you, you probably have to go back to the 1700s or that late where organ meats were the only thing people could afford to eat. It's like a delicacy now. People it is interesting, it isn't it? Uh, um, quite often, yeah, they, yeah, you're right. Because I particularly like liver, but a lot of people don't. No, because we're just not growing up with it. We're not uh, exposed to it. And kidney, uh, well, kidneys, uh, steak and kidney pie. <laughs> no, <laughs> but that's my own personal take. That's right. Uh, uh, so, sorry for all those uh, great chefs and, and uh, pie pastries out there. It put, please put uh, pie, uh, kidney and steak pies on your plate and but on your facade. But that's not a dish that I'll put. I'll eat it, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not something I'll go and prepare. It. <laughs> we all have likes and dislikes. We do have likes and dislikes. Uh, it's important makes why, why it makes us different. You know, we have different attitudes and likes and perspectives. And how we're all individuals. We've grown up differently. We do things different in the world. But we're all human. We're all biological creature. We're all an animal. We just know with good science that we have nowadays that we're not eating enough vegetable content. And it's something we really are trying to push. I argue that if you look at your starch you've got a better way of trying to carry that vegetable content. Rethink what your breakfast option is. Rethink your lunch. Dinner, everyone gets right. Even if the having peas on the plate at night time does come under duress and we push them around and play with them, <laughs> if I have one or two of them, most people get dinner right, the evening meal right. But having breakfast and lunch, that takes time. And then because we don't have that, in, going back to the point I was making earlier, we don't have that individual at home whose role it is to just run the household, 
you have to think about it doing yourself. And in terms of an option is to look at the evening meal, asking yourself, can I cook a little bit extra up? That I might be an option to have it as a, as a morning meal. Breakfast doesn't, isn't a meal that you have to have at seven o'clock in the morning either. The word breakfast simply means to break fast. We're just looking for a meal to have during the morning hours because we just know that once you get to midday or such and you haven't eaten by then, you're going to have a hungry bear. It's just a way of tempering your eating habits throughout the day. The old adage, eat like a king for breakfast, eat like a queen for lunch and eat like a king, uh, a pauper for the evening meal rings very true, but you don't have to have it at 7 o'clock, 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. It's just our economics that locks us into that time frame. Great study, two, ro two rooms, glassed in, oh sorry, walled in, no windows, one room with a clock, one without, and asking when people are hungry, the people that you came up with two distinct time frames when people thought they felt they were hungry. One was watching the clock, one without. Quite a significant time difference. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Just let your appetite be your guide. A lot of people just don't feel like eating at seven o'clock in the morning. They just don't have an appetite for it. But by nine o'clock, you've been up and about. You should be up and up and about. <laughs> and you've been active. Then the body should be ready to accept a meal. Do things change at all if you're someone who has to regularly do like night shift? I think shift work has to be one of the unhealthiest lifestyles that we suffer as a, as a community. It sucks. <laughs> it, there is no health benefit for, uh, other than uh, beyond uh, our low social economic status and a lot of people that are on shift tend to be of a low social economic status anyway there tends to be a little strong link uh, lower income uh, poor work environments uh, essentially but we just know by itself a shift because miners are out there um, making a mozza, being a miner, but working shift work, 12 hours on, or, and working you know, four days straight, for uh, very poor health outcomes. And is there anything nutritionally that we can do to dissipate some of the negative side effects, or Be not really? Preparing. It's just, just preparing. Yeah. So you're just looking for those three good spreads a meal. If you're a fairly heavy labourer on a shift work, you're going to want about four, if not five meals spread through that time frame. So having that meal, if you're going to rock up to work and the first thing you do is going to have a shovel in your hand you don't want to be eating half an hour provided you want to be eating a good couple of hours however if you've started working at four o'clock in the morning and you're going to be shovel in hand you've got to think that night before meal that's your that last meal at night time that's comfortable in serving size but nourishing enough to be able to when you wake up in the morning you can do the start doing that physical work and then work your four hour spacing after that it's just, uh, you know, four o'clock in the morning, the, the, the psychotic rhythm just doesn't allow us to accept food at that hour in the morning. It just doesn't work. So you just have to prepare the, the meal, last meal the night before and then work from after you start working. Uh, you start at four and you're likely to have a break at seven. That's when you have time to have your, your next major meal. Yeah. And then, but no, it's, you, you pay a price. The shift worker pays a health price. It's and a performance price. And a, in uh, their, their work. Yeah. No, I meant in, in work and in training. In training, if work. you've got somebody that's in shift work and, and train. If you've got a... a yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, yeah. Interesting about that, what else in fact our training is school kids. You do, uh, especially about exam time, you want to get them out of your gym. That let them go focus on their uh, scholastic achievements during exam time. They don't need to be concentrating on trying to do uh, s sport performance during their time. You run a risk of them injuring themselves. Get them out to say your, your school time. So, no, so all coaches in their gym should know when the exam time is wrong. So what are you doing here? Go focus on that at the time. Yes, they're still going to be elite athletes if they want to be, but they've still got scholastic uh, roles that they need to do. That's not a time or place because your injury rate tends to go up that way. And we're looking for well-balanced athletes. Yes. We don't want, we want, yes. you got to look for life after athletics as well, right? <laughs> you only got that short time and essentially the peak, yes, but you've got to put in place strategies that gives you a backup, like a lot of backup plan. Yeah, what's, what's your backup plan? Because it could all go pear-shaped tomorrow. Oh, it's so easily. It's just, we run a risk every time we're doing this, any type of uh, physical activity, it just, there's a risk. 
how much risk we're willing to take, what's the reward risk reward ratio, we have to think about that. Um, so, but we want balance in our life, it's important. Um, you, you, this, those individuals around that one person, they want to see you, they have a conversation with you, they want to be able to um, talk about the weather to you, okay? You don't want to stare at somebody that has no uh, conversational pieces beyond their sport. We all need to be aware of the world around us. But yeah, so shift work, um, we try to balance where you're placing your meals to try and get as optimal a level of nutrition for you and be able to achieve in sporting. I think shift works, if there's one thing that's really risky for them is their sleeping patterns. Mm. I would say that. Sleeping in fluid, keeping their, just keeping themselves hydrated and, and sleeping patterns. Very hard to sleep good length of period of time and having that deep REM type of, uh, of sleep as well too. And if you guys are more interested in sleep, there's a really great book you should read called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Dr. Matthew Walker, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I definitely highly recommend everyone read that. I've just written a couple of things here, uh, just some notes to uh, just, so we've talked about vegetables, uh, protein, even for your elite power lifter, anything more, about one point, I'll be, again, I'm gonna be a bit technical here, but uh, an adult who is even in a hypertrophy mode, somewhere around 1.4 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. You'll find in a lot of the literature uh, in magazines and such, you'll have your elite powerlifter, uh, body, bodybuilder, somewhere around the three grams a day. Once you go beyond two, your ki you're putting your kidneys under quite a significant stress. You really are, it's a, quite a detrimental impact on your kidneys to get, essentially what your body will do, it'll just get rid of it. it beyond two grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day, you're eating excess of what body can actually metabolize, can actually do with, can actually um, hypertrophy. So essentially high protein diets run uh, costly and really just increase your, uh, the effort that the kidneys have to be uh, put on. Now the kidneys are one of the organs that love being worked, but fluid based. They love just having flushing the water through the system. They don't need to be getting rid of excess protein in the form of urea. Urea, once we, we break down protein into urea and carbohydrate um, and other little components, but essentially your body has to get rid of that urea. And so, and that means you flush, it takes water out of your body too. So you're, dehy you're dehydrating yourself quite significantly with a high protein diet. So, as a, so how much protein is in food? Now as a real rough rule of thumb, about a third of the weight is about a protein. So a bit of steak, 100 grams, you're getting about 30 grams of protein. It's a real rough, there's quite a variation there, but something, fish is a little bit higher in protein than red meat, uh, your nuts are a, low, a little bit lower, but essentially just to look at a meal and say to yourself, okay, there's 100 grams of meat, that's 30 grams. If you're a 70 kilo athlete, three meals a day, 300 grams of total animal product, there's 90 grams of protein for your day. So do you think most people are eating too much protein then? Yeah, well, because we're taking supplements, we tend to overindulge them as well. Not at our level, not our sport, but more of your bodybuilders and, and uh, super heavies, Will. Interesting uh, picture, it's always in the papers around uh, Olympic time and uh, a uh, fairly large athlete and in front of them is this pile of food and they're saying, I have to eat all of this. You do, you have to eat that amount of food to keep yourself that, if you want to be a super heavy, where weight, your total body weight is not a concern, it's just pure power that you want, you can overindulge as much as you like, but you're paying a price in terms of the health of your kidneys. Yeah. But if you're looking at a power to weight ratio athletes, and you want to keep them leaner, anything above uh, 1, 1.5 is a, is a nice number to work with for most adults. Adolescents, 1.8. So you, you want to be pop, you want to be a little bit more snacking with protein-based foods with your adolescents because they're growing. And what are good snacks? Nuts, legumes. Nuts, yeah, good. And of course, yes, as we mentioned, you do get a, a so a nice. Uh, sometimes I'll sit after training with a can of baked beans. Yeah. So I'm getting both a carb and a protein serve at the same time, and I might put nuts in the baked beans as well because I want to balance that protein environment. I mentioned that before. Essentially, a nice little handful. Now you don't sit with a bag of nuts and just eat them. 
you put them in a meal if you can, it just gives you a little bit more. Um, you, we don't tend to overindulge. A bit of yogurt, maybe. Yes, nuts and, and, and I'm just thinking about like what to send your kids to school with. Yeah, that's not as a snack. Yeah, and you can get grated uh, almond. Yep. Mix that through there as well too. So it brings up the protein content and your carb content quite nicely. Um, cheese and, and apple. It's a nice little handy uh, lunchbox item or a, a, post, a, a training day just to bring up that protein content. Um, drinks of milk. Flavoured milk. You've got to weigh up your weight here. She is. Are you about to tell me that chocolate milk is good for me? Because <laughs> uh, you might just change my life. If you're really trying to bump up your total <laughs> calorie content, there's a place for it. But I think the amount of added as calorie base in your, uh, no names, but essentially a, a, a flavoured drink, I don't think there's a, the way up. Uh, there's no real benefit. I, I would. I used to uh, say, getting a glass of milk, and I might put a teaspoon of um, ice cream flavouring in my milk. Yeah. What about Milo? Well, again, you, a lot of sugar content. Uh, it's a way of flavouring your milk. You just don't. I suppose I would say, don't have a big crunchy layer on the top. <laughs> you don't need that. You just want. Something. Isn't that the best? Bit? Yes. <laughs> That's the best part of the point of drinking it. And then you put sugar in there as well, too. I've been there, done that, and everything's all my years of living off the stuff. Um, <laughs> so protein has a part to play, but really we can achieve our protein intakes with general sensible eating patterns. We can get there quite easily. So 1.1 uh, to 1.5 grams per kilo body of body weight? Yep. Um, for your and normal it, adult population, even if you're trying to hypertrophy, you still will cover. Adolescence, then one point eight. Won't you be up there? One point yeah. eight to close to two, you can get away with. But beyond two, you're really putting a stress level on your kidneys. Even if you are at two, even for and especially for kids, adolescents, pushing their fluid intake just so important. The smaller we are, the greater our body surface, the higher we dehydrate quicker. So essentially, why we find that very young uh, uh, your infants and your elderly are very high significant risk of dehydration one elderly because our kidney functions probably quite deteriorated anyway and so we lose a lot of fluid the body loses the ability to maintain its fluid load and your uh, uh, your infants because of their small uh, sorry their significant their quite large surface area sorry I got the wrong way around yeah the smaller you are quite significant so, so they lose a lot of fluid through their skin uh, but for kids, we all of us, we're just not drinking enough fluid. And straight out, if, if uh, after a session, drinking your milk, not only getting the protein carb, but you're getting uh, hydration there as well too. And uh, there is a maximum amount of protein you can have in a sitting, roughly, in maybe? In a sitting. Or in a meal, like... Didn't you say the other day it was we like have, 25 to 30 grams? Right, right. Well, the recommendation is to give yourself... Once you've had a hit of training, your body is very receptive to hypertrophy straight off that training. So it's, it's a big sponge. So it wants to be hit by a good serving of protein and carbohydrate. And the recommended uh, research papers are saying 20 grams of carbohydrate protein. Sorry straight within that first 20 minutes post training because your body then has you're in a hormonal environment that is conducive to hypertrophy what that hormonal pro, uh, environment is comes about is because your insulin levels have risen once you start training your body's um uh, your, your, your adrenal glands will produce insulin and insulin is an anabolic hormone it's designed to build muscle it's getting this uh reception this message you're doing work we want to build and we want to build up your muscle tissue so the next time you do that work you'll be you're more efficient at it. it's a nice little biomechanical fe uh, biofeedback here so essentially when we're doing significant work for a significant period of time and i'm talking about 90 minutes out of 60 to 90 minutes, your insulin levels will be at a high level so your body is in a hormonal point where it's really a very efficient in rebuilding muscle tissue now you need to give it the substrate to allow it to do that and that's the protein and the carb and we just know that good 20 gram hit of protein 20 minutes uh, within that 20 minute time frame and one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight 
So. And that's total over the day as no, well. No, that's oh no, oh, that's just post, that's for that just the, for that post training. Period. Okay. Then over the day, uh, you, you, one uh, over the day we're saying one point four to one point six grams of uh, kilogram of protein. Yes, throughout the day. So yep. so you sorry taking twenty grams of that protein out of it for post training, yep. and then the rest of it is spread throughout the day. And that, it ends up being one to one anyway, roughly. How do you mean that, sorry? Ah, uh, because. <laughs> We're splitting our carbohydrates yeah. and proteins and like half the plate anyway. So yeah, be well, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. if you were to gather the entire food uh, quantity, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I wanted to say that. So really, you've got that opportunity every time you train uh, a weight training for a good hour and a half. Your body's will hypertrophy. It wants the hypertrophy straight away. It's just that hormonal environment. So hit yourself with a good protein and carb. Prior to a training session, you want a good carb environment because you, even for a sh uh, minimum amount of reps uh, and low repetitions that we do, after an hour and a half, you're going to be quite glycogen depleted. And so by having a good source of carbohydrate an hour, a couple of hours prior to your training session, you've got a readily available source of energy to do the work. If you're not eating a couple of hours prior to your training session, you're going to be energy depleted. You're not going to get through the volume. So it's really important that you're thinking about your carb prior to the training session, carb and protein post-training session. Too often, especially on a weekend, a Saturday, kids have a late night, they rock up to training mid-morning and they haven't eaten and wondering why they don't get through their training session. I've had national runners, I had one particular one stands out in my mind, uh, heading to Sydney every afternoon, wasn't getting through the training load. Oh, well, let's have a look at your st general start to the day. What's your first meal of the day? Oh, lunchtime. And gets upset at me because I'm saying, well, we need to be thinking about what's your first meal of the day. Is. And kids don't like eating meals for <laughs> breakfast, do they? And they want to get, but they want to get through the training load. But when you're that young, you'll, you, you'll get by. But if you want to reach that absolute elite level, you have to plan your eating habits. It becomes a beyond the sense, well, I. I just don't feel like it. You, we're seeing you need to see that need as part of the process of achieving those goals. It becomes uh, more food should always still be enjoyable, but sometimes role food has to be part of the means by achieving your goals. Even though you might be, if if if, you, if it's not quite nauseating, we can find other ways. We can change your times. But essentially, having that having that good spread of meals throughout the day. It's the basic under it's basic tenet of outcome, good outcome. Uh, what else did I write? Yeah, okay. I'm I'm holding my paperwork farther. <laughs> I've got my glasses on it. Yeah, so okay, Pat. Uh, hard training. So carb. So carbs important pre and post. Um, proteins more important post. But your vegetables are important to be spread throughout the day. And what about our fats? Well, fats in make food enjoyable. So even if, we, if it takes a little bit of a butter spread melted in your vegetables to make the, bu the vegetables more palatable, way to go. And I recommend bet butter rather than margarine. It's, you can use less of it and it spreads better. Um, and you're only, because it's such a small amount, it's not going to have any impact in terms of weight or, or um, in the internal environment, we might, we often think of high fat content related to um, cholesterol. That's quite true, but it's more the fact that from foods to takeaway foods, highly processed meals. That's the major concern of fat intake, rather than putting a bit of butter on top of your vegetables to make it palatable. Uh, oil doesn't do that, although oil is better for the heart health rather than butter. A good olive oil in a salad is a very nice thing. Butter doesn't go in a salad, so we use our oil, good quality oil. And I mean, go and find a nice, good quality oil and just using a nice drizzle and a bit of balsamic vinegar makes the salads very tip top, very, very pleasurable to eat. You just have to wear, I often, my wife tells me to wear a napkin when I'm eating a salad with balsamic vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> it's just got somewhere everywhere. It does, I'm terrible like that. Um, uh, oh, well, okay. There's no superfoods out there. We're seeing quite often if you're eating your kale, it's a superfood. If you're eating 
Uh, and there's always week after week there's something in the media about one particular food being a uh, cure blueberries a, a, quinoa a, a quinoa that's right and they come and go sure enough if you ha- there might there are there's a range of components in all varieties but if you're getting a good variety of foods you are most likely in fact you definitely will be covering your bases for everything you need to do you don't need to sit one particular food in a in a dietary habit that's um, going to be a cure-all. It don't, they don't exist. I will say, though, if there is one food that has a direct impact on a health outcome, it is our legumes. Legumes are quite unique in the fact that they release an energy form in the, in the form of butyrate uh, in its digestive process, and that energy is a direct source of fuel for the lining of the large bowel. Unfortunately, the large bowel is a very poorly um, vasculated, has a very poor supply of um, blood to the internal lining. And that comes about because the large bowel is not designed to absorb food. It's more designed to release back into the large bowel waste product. So it doesn't need to have a, a significant um, vascular, vascular system. So how the body evolved in keeping the lining of the large bowel healthy was legumes releasing that butyrate and feeding the lining of the bowel directly. We've lost legumes out of our diet. Now I'm not saying that uh, there's, a, there's a direct cause and effect between uh, not having enough butyrate and bowel cancer, but we just know that bowel cancer is a significant condition that we're suffering as a human, uh, 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 human uh, society. Uh, in terms of cancers, uh, for women only, we see breast cancer as being a major source of cancer concern. For males, prostate. But when you bring both of those sexes together, it's the bowel cancer. And, and we're seeing a concern from government just by having those uh, uh, blood tests, uh, the uh, stool samples that you can, that the uh, government quite ha- happily sends you out on your 50th birthday and then every two years after. I recommend everybody uh, fill that up and send them off. However, how can we reduce the risk of bowel cancer? Wait, the government sends what? A, b- a bowel test. Every t- When you turn 50, you get, really? a, you get a present from the government. It's a, it comes in a, uh, about a, a A5 uh, parcel. It, it is, you know about it. It's, it's not in a brown paper bag. <laughs> so the postie knows, ah, oh, here's a 50 year old. <laughs> <laughs> So everyone gets Everyone. One. Everyone that's a registered uh, resident in Australia receives, right, every, everybody, every territory and every uh, state ah. receives, when they turn 50, a bowel, uh, a, a stool sample kit. And then you, if, if you're keen, you can t- dip uh, stick A and stick B and put it into a, a suitable tube and put it in the mail and send it off to the local lab. Huh. And if you don't hear anything back, that's good. But if you do, then they're saying, well, something's up, there's blood, you need to go and see your doctor for further tests. Polyps are quite a significant issue. Diverticular disease might also give you... So there are conditions that may give you a, a reason that the government will send you off to see them, to get you checked out, just to uh, see that it, it's not a bowel cancer or not, it's another condition that we might be able to be, get you to be aware of. And diverticular disease is quite a significant condition. Um, polyps... Um, some GI, GI upsets like Crohn's or uh, colitis. You'll generally know if you've got those conditions, you've had them all your life. But any type of um, if, uh, irritable bowel, it might pop, it might pop up as a uh, thing, but they, they see that you're, you're clear in terms of bowel cancer. Okay, But every two years, it's, uh, they'll send you a number. Huh. Until you're 75. And they there. give up on you. Well, unfortunately... <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's... that's a, there's a question of where we can spend money. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but unfortunately, we get such a poor number of people actually to fill it out because it's something we don't, don't like to see. Talk, going back to talking about bowels, once you've done a bowel motion, on the occasion, have a look. <laughs> have a look. Is there anything odd? Is there anything that might give you concern and say, well, that doesn't look normal? Know your bowel habits. Particularly if it's something that you didn't eat. (laughs) I didn't eat that. (laughs) 
That, that's right. Know you about know what it looks like if it changes colour. Yeah, sure enough. On the occasion we get we for, for most middle um, from about our teens right through to our sixties, we can eat a lot of foods that the body just says, well, that's not really good for me. I'll just flush it through the system. So we end up with that little bit of uh, diarrhoea or, uh, or bowel upset, but it's gone in the, in that couple of hours. Way it goes. Your body is very efficient of knowing that something wasn't quite right about that in that it's something I was just a little bit off do you know you ever do you know the taste of milk when it's just going off and you've put it in your coffee you don't see the floaty bits but you've tasted it and say well that milk is off and straight down the sink yeah you just know but it, and dairy foods are like that they they turn and you don't they tell you, you know, it's fine because there's an instant taste as well and smell but there's a lot but of then if you leave it for a little bit longer you get yogurt <laughs> 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 in the right conditions. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one. Are you all right? But essentially, yeah, in the, in, it all depends on the bacteria <laughs> that, that's in that is making the yoga. Some of us make it sick. Some of, we This environment we, that we're in, it's, it's, an, it's not a sterile environment. Everything you touch and breathe. It's, we're, but our body has a great barrier process by it keeps us protected. Once we cut ourselves, we really have to be quite careful. We need to get that sealed and cleaned up quickly because we're just bombarded with bacteria. As soon as you cut yourself, it's in being invaded. And if the body has any form of um, uh, lacking of uh, self-defense, uh, all of a sudden you'll get an infection. And in the environment that we live in, where we've got, we've got the medical system that allows us to work on that, that's good. But if you've got cr other chronic conditions, diabetes, um, or your age and fail, frail, um, you just don't need that pressure on the body to try and uh, repair itself. So oh, anyway, so uh, what was I saying? Uh, my train of thought again. So we were talking about milk at one stage. Yeah, uh, uh, oh, oh no. the gut. We're going. Yeah. Yeah, stool. We're talking about stool. The, the stool. Looking at stool. Looking at stool. So essentially, if we do eat something that's a little bit off, we mightn't taste it, but the body has a great capacity to say, right, uh, well, I don't want that. Let's get rid of it and flush it through the system, and you'll come, it'll come up. You'll see. Oh, that's oh, that's different. But if a chain, if it's only just that once off every now and then, then you just simply put it down to the fact that you've eaten something that just wasn't quite right. However, if it's consistent, then you want to get it checked out. And you can look at your stool and use something like the Bristol stool chart. Uh, yes. Well, the Bristol stool chart is giving you a sense of texture. Uh, texture. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So whether it's pellety or whether it's a uh, sausage shape, and we should be aiming for a sausage shape. Uh, some people argue whether they should float or not. I'm not quite sure. I don't usually look at the <laughs> bottom of my uh, bowl of <laughs> to see if it floats. Uh, so generally just flush it down. So I'm looking for colour. But it's really and you're not looking for soup. No, <laughs> if, yeah, no, you should you should have a form substance. Stool, okay, yeah. if you've got a form of diarrhoea, it's because your body's brought all that fluid in there to flush it out. Um, because there was something not right, and so the body is uh, quite uh, quite adaptive in to do that. Uh, and we eat, we're exposed. We, we just might be a little bit. Um, usually, it's food that we've eaten that was just a bit off. So, we, proper food handling techniques. Uh, the greatest amount of food poisoning happens in our own home. Yes, we hear occasionally in the news, twenty five people came down with uh, food poisoning from a local restaurant but that's not the norm we have good food um, safety uh, methods training and, uh, and regulation regulations that protect us in large environments because you've got one or two people that are producing a great deal of food for uh, so, so we really have to be careful they really don't have to store it because they have to hold food in and quite significant uh, uh, quantities but it tends to be turned over we tend to buy in bulk and then put it in the fridge there and it can sit there for days and then finally we get around to eating it and we don't cook it through enough um, and so we haven't uh, made it um, biologically clean, uh, uh, safe and it doesn't take too much. But for most uh, adults of a good general health, your body will recognise that and will flush it through the system. But if you're a very young individual or a frail early or somebody that has a pre-existing uh, pre condition, that can be quite, uh, hit you in terms of your health and put you in hospital. It doesn't take that much. 
So essentially, for all of us, ha proper uh, home uh, food safety. Turn it over if you're not turn if you're not using something regular. Put it in the freezer. Uh, meat can stay in the freezer for a good three months. It can go for twelve months, really. But essentially, after three months, you want to. If you have if you've got something that's frozen in the freezer for more than three months, either cook it up or get rid of it. It's just its quality has dropped quite significantly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but your fruit and vegetables, which buying in small quantities and then turning it over fresh frozen is as good if not better than fresh the frozen vegetables are picked and snap frozen virtually on site picked uh, pretty much within hours um, and so that nutritional level is locked in away you go and then you and it's usually cut and nice serving portion so you easy can, you're easy you don't have yeah you don't have to prepare it and you're reducing your uh, wastage and that's a good thing in the environment as well too um, people Tend, can still be put uh, with mocha on frozen vegetables. Um, I like to buy local. There, there's a great number of companies in Australia that produce, grow and freeze locally sourced vegetables. If you have a concern, look on the packaging and say where, did, where was it sourced from. And if you don't like that idea, then buy another brand. And uh, I have personal preferences myself, in which supermarket I buy my frozen vegetables. Some I'll buy frozen from one, but not on the other. Uh, just, uh, you, a lot of you, big companies have good ways of transporting frozen vegetables, and so you don't want. If you've got a uh, block of ice, probably frozen frozen vegetables. Complain. Take it back and say that's not how it should be. It should be able to be poured. Put a free flowing and it's snap frozen and away you go. If you've got a block of ice, and that the comp what's happened is that the transporting process that allows those vegetables to, be, to defrost and then be refrozen, and that mm. process turns it into ice and it's not what you're looking for. A different if you've already opened it and then well, then that's your own fault, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you should be able to just open it up and then take out what you want and put it back in the freezer yeah. and away you go. Uh, Has that covered everything that you wanted to get through? I think so. What are these books that you've brought for? Okay, so well, there are good information for the general pop population. Uh, Dr. Louise Burke and Greg Cox are two major Australian uh, nutrition writers uh, for us, at both uh, AIS, uh, both uh, international uh, recognised uh, diet, sports dietitians and represented, they've gone to the Olympics a number of times and fed our, dietitian, uh, fed our athletes overseas. And so you had individuals there, there on site and be able to give advice. But a book out there that's been around in a number of editions, uh, Complete Guide to Food for Sports Performance. And it ranges through from endurance sports to um, power sports, uh, uh, tennis. Um, I don't think there's an article about um, lawn bowls in here, but I would generally say that we come under a general good <laughs> nutrition for lawn, lawn bowls. Sorry, people who play lawn bowls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for it yet. <laughs> When, uh, you, when you're 75 uh, and they stop sending you the... <laughs> I know. <laughs> so uh, so th uh, this, that, this is a clinical book. That's certainly you won't find that in the general thing, uh, clinical sports nutrition. So I do have a text that is clinically based. It is mathematically based. It is, gives me exact figures. But what's something that you... Uh, a regular individual out there that might like to have a read. It's very good reading. It's uh, Food for Sports Performance from uh, Dr. Louise Burke and, and Greg Cox. Um, other texts are out there. Nutrition for Sports, you type up those and there's a good range of Australian written texts out there and you can find a text about your particular sport being power or uh, being endurance. And they're very different in terms of their nutrition. Uh, power and sports and where, where you are in your cycle of training as uh, hypertrophy or your body want to change body weight um, or um, it, just the time of the year as well the season you know what's what foods are available just knowing what foods are available in any t season of the year is a really good important piece of information that we just don't know anymore hopping up line hopping online uh, typing up what's in season what, when I go shopping next, what's the type of vegetables I should be able to buy so I can buy fresh? Yeah. And that's when it's going to be cheapest. But use them up, buy small quantities, and then turn it over. Interesting uh, research paper I was talking to Andrew earlier. Uh, one of the uh, top 10 reasons people don't buy vegetables is they're too heavy. It's simply mm. the weight of carrying vegetables home. We don't shop 
small and often. Oh, I suppose, yeah, no, most of us don't do a Thursday night shop anymore. So we can buy a small and often and then include, you don't have to buy every single vegetable in one hit. You know, say to yourself, okay, I need a couple of carrots for this meal, but I might use it in two days' time too. So have that, they'll last that long. They're not going to go off. Once I start going, yeah, I'll carry it when it starts. So yeah. <laughs> getting <laughs> floppy. Yeah, getting floppy. Uh, it's, yeah, and it starts getting the black patches around the side of it. Uh, so it's time to throw it out. But frozen, but you might have that packet of frozen uh, carrot, baby carrots in the freezer instead. And so you've always got an option there. Uh, so frozen can and often is better than fresh. But buy f if you're buying fresh, and I recommend it too, but you just know you're going to have to prepare it, is buy in season. Know, know your seasonal uh, variety. Um, uh, I just, oh, somebody else I've got up here, but I haven't, I haven't barely had a taste of it. Is a bottle of water. That we all carry around water. Refill them from a local uh, fountain rather than buying water. You know, bottle can actually be more expensive than uh, fuel. Amazing how much we're buying in fuel. How many different varieties of bottled water we have. Um, and the advertising and that goes into each one. Yes. Uh, oh. It, 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 Water plays a very important part, but you're not getting any benefit by buying a so-called uh, nutrient-flavoured water. And tap water is as excellent as any form of water you can, you know, even, even tap water in Australia. We were talking about if you're travelling overseas. Sure enough, if you are travelling overseas, stick with your bottled water because essentially the environment that you're in is not the normal bio... Uh, um, not the normal um, bacterial environment that you experience at home. So it's, it's sometimes if you're overseas for a short period of time to compete, you're at very high risk of forming some, getting some form of GI upset because the gut's just not used to that type of environment. So protect yourself by washing your hands, drinking water out of a bottle, uh, boiling as much as you can, uh, buying food that's cook, well cooked through, especially, yeah, well, this, I'm not going to pick on any one country, but essentially foods that are cooked in front of you if possible, and cooked hot, uh, especially with the steak overseas, you want to have a well cooked. It's not the time to have a blue steak when you're overseas. After the training, after your event, <laughs> yeah, sure enough. If you're, if you're in Paris and all of a sudden you've just finished a major run and, and then all of a sudden they're offering you uh, uncooked um, of all of sorts and say fine if that's your fancy okay but you're in another country you just don't know the food doesn't know you the food doesn't know you and essentially leave that for after as a treat after your event so because if you get a GI upset at least you can just go and hide take some uh, bowel um, prep Imodium. <laughs> Imodium, that's what I was trying to think of <laughs> can I can I talk about one last thing before we finish up do you have time or do you have to run? No, well, actually, oh, too late now. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I just realised, look at the time. Um, can we talk about, like, anyway. popular diet? You can train here if you want. We can do that. Um, popular diets of the day. All right. So if you go over, we've had the Israeli diets. We've had paleo diet. It's still very much in the, in the media and constant because there's an individual out there that's pushing it quite often in the, and they have the media outlet that allows them to do that. Um, is that Pete Evans? Not Pete, no. Uh, is it the, uh, not the vet. No, is, it, is it one of the cook? No, he's a cook. Ah. Yeah, so he's got a cooking show and promotes the idea of uh, paleo. And has been in quite significant uh, trouble with um, the health department because of the paleo diet that he's been pushing for infants and found to be quite nutrient uh, um, inappropriate. Anyway, so I won't mention names. Um, what else is out there? Name uh, and shame, Pete. Name and no. shame. No. <laughs> well, okay. Then you've got the researched type of name, CSIRO. Okay. Yeah. Uh, CSIRO diet that's been around for a while. Veganism, vegetarianism, uh, isms. Have you ever seen this new carnivore diet that a bunch of people are on? Where well, they only eat meat? It's a form of the Atkins diet, really. Yeah. So essentially, you're on a uh, no or very low carbohydrate diet, and you will lose weight. But now you're going to have kidney issues, you're going to have a high fat diet, you're going to have heart, this is probably going to promote some form of heart uh, issues with it as well, the amount of cholesterol and saturated fat that you're going to get with that type of eating pattern. Yes, we are, we're not 
carnivores. We are omnivores. We're not. Uh, we eat both plants and animals. I believe that we can survive quite well on a non-animal based diet. We can survive quite well on vegetarian. Vegans have to be very careful. They really put a risk of being undernourished, being on it. So you have to you just be very careful. The only st a time in a vegan's life I have very cons strong concerns is, is during pregnancy. Because there is no non-animal food that can provide you with uh, better than uh, a B12, vitamin B12. The only way you can uh, then take is through the injections. Uh, uh, in fact, that's the only way you can do it. There is no food. It will, uh, mushrooms are not a form of B, uh, B12 that is assimilated for the human diet. It has a form of B12, but we don't have access to it. We don't use it as a, uh, to allow it to uh, build muscle, uh, blood cells. So essentially, uh, if especially, especially when you're pregnant and you are vegan, then see your doctor. Cover yourself with your B12 injections. Um, and that's the only, uh, that would be the only thing I'd say. Pre-pregnancy for all women, your, uh, your folate intake, a good source of folate is green leafy vegetables. Really pushing up. Yes, it's. I don't mind uh, pregnancy to consider a broad spectrum uh, vitamin supplement. Uh, cent okay, well, I will mention this. Uh, Centrum's a good brand. You can just get your Pendivite, and even for uh, for baby Pendivite as an adult, you still can take it. You'll get a you'll get a supply of uh, a broad range of vitamin minerals, vitamins. Uh, but generally, for the general population, we promote the idea of a mixed diet, having both plant-based and animal-based, but mostly plant-based. We do encourage that. We're not talking about being a vegetarian. Trying to have smaller quantities of better quality animal foods. Meat can be expensive, but we generally like to see a large serving size on the plate. We like to see the meat hanging over the side of the plate. You don't, a, a side of port, a porterhouse steak can actually feed two people. It doesn't have to feed, it doesn't have to heat, feed one. You can actually divide it up the two. Um, and that way you keep the costs down and you're keeping your portion sizes down. And that's a good, and it's a good for the environment as well too. Um, that's a hot, we could go on to another subject of about animals uh, use in our, for us, but animals have been part of the human diet for millennia since that day. But vegetables vegetables are what we gathered and animal foods we chased. So we always had plant-based foods on a day-to-day -day basis and animal foods were something that came across on an ad hoc process, but enough to keep us, allow us to grow. But nowadays we've got access to both, but because of uh, re reasonable uh, affordability, reasonable affordability, and because of their taste and enjoyment, we tend to overemphasize our meat in our diet too much. You should still see half that plate vegetables and a quarter of that plate. It's the uh, just something another something that occurred to me in days gone past. When you had a guest over, when you served the meal to your guest, you served it with the meat to your guest facing you. It was a kind of way of saying to, to their guests. I'm well enough to afford to provide you with meat on your plate. But every other day of the week, we should turn it the other way around. We, we, we serve ourselves with the vegetables to us and the meat and the carbs sits at the back of the plate. It's the vegetables that my voice is going to go in and out because I'm moving. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can a, hear that, can you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, can, I, I can hear the sound. So essentially, on a day-to-day -day basis, we serve the vegetables to us and the meat and the carb is the background of the plate. But when you have guests, when you go out for a restaurant, you always find it's the meat, so yeah, it's the other way around. Interesting. Um, so so and plant, and plants, uh, all basic diets in, uh, in what we consider a reasonably acceptable form of education, we say mostly plants in the background of an, of an animal-based. Um, your Atkins diet, it's no carb, well that's unbalanced. Okay, and carb is the most potent form of ability to do work. So you, you, you fail in terms of being day-to-day -day activity. You feel lethargic, you feel, um, you're just not gonna get through training methods any type of no-carb diet. So it's not a basic eating pattern for anybody that plays sport. Um, you're, um, well, uh, 
who, what else is out there? Anybody, any type of diet that's excessive in one thing, that's not an appropriate type of message to be promoting, essentially. Of course, we want a range of nutrients throughout the day, just to keep our body uh, ticking over better. And adherence is a big deal as well, right? Well, something about a general good eating habit is something that you tend to do day after day, week after week, li- uh, over your, through your life. Like but it's diet, hard to be diet, on a very restrictive. You're thinking about it at, uh, all the time, it, it detracts from life, the enjoyment of life. You're always trying to think uh, where you're going to be, how much, what foods I need to prepare to be able to stay on this diet. That's not fun. No. Uh, this life. Food is enjoyable. It's part of uh, our being. It's, uh, we do it every day. Uh, we socialize. Well, interesting, we don't actually eat for the sake of nutrients. We eat for, the, for a lot of other reasons. Reward, um, enjoyment, habit. The big thing about why we eat is just purely habit. We don't think about what we're eating. We just put it, in, put it on a bowl, put it on a plate, and we eat it without thinking about it. Um, weddings, any time of gathering, we tend to gather around food. Food it becomes an intimate part of pretty much every uh, activity that we do on a day-to-day basis, be it in an office, be it in a work, uh, work uh, in a factory floor, or be it at home. Food tends to be part of our, our doing. Uh, unfortunately, we, it, well, okay, it's just that in this day and age, we have access, readily access to the apple strudel, the um, Oreos that have, what's the new Oreos they have now? They're combined in with uh, uh, chocolate in the center or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, if you're going to have an Oreo, have an Oreo. <laughs> it's a special treat. But you, uh, and you just know that um, when Uncle Bob's visiting and haven't seen, you haven't seen him for the last two years, you go and buy the most luxurious cake you can find and sit down and enjoy it together. But you don't buy it again until uh, it next come along. But if Uncle Bob, co- if Auntie Jane comes next week and then it's a birthday the week after, then it's a wedding that I have. Then you have to think about, well, how often are these foods becoming part of my day-to-day being? Yeah. And we need just being, because most of us, I'm just saying, uh, most of us walk around blinkered, very blinkered. We don't reflect our general eating habits, We're just being a bit more aware. Asking yourself the question, what did I have for breakfast yesterday and the day before? Am I getting a bit of variety? What did I have for lunch? Keep a diary. Do a, uh, Keep a diary for a few days just to be able to reflect what variety of carbs and starches you're having. What's your timing of your meal? Do I get hungry at a certain hour constantly? What did I do a few hours prior to that? Can I change my timing of the meals just to, so I change how my hunger uh, is related? If I, do I need to go back for seconds every single meal at night time? How mu- then how much am I eating during the day? Um, uh, do I, are those packets of Tim Tams in my cupboard going through week after week without my realising? And a shopper's treat does count as calorie intake, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> they do have calories. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're going, if you're doing small shops three or four times a week, every time you go through that checkout, you're buying that uh, Mars bar, that's a lot of calories. But most of us just, because we're walking around, blink it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, we don't, um, it register. It doesn't register to it. It becomes such a habit, we become blind to it. And, uh, and I was just thinking to myself the other day, we only, for most of us, we put on about a kilo a year on average. So over 40 years, and put on 40 kilos and it's you know, 40 years goes very quickly and you're wondering why those pants go up, uh, more and more and we just and what we do we, instead of thinking I need to change my lifestyle habits here we just buy bigger cl- uh, bigger clothes yeah and move up away class yeah <laughs> <laughs> so essentially which could, if you're a 75 kilo 20 year old um, our body, uh, our evidence shows us you should be a 75 kilo, uh, 80 year old. It's, we should be managing our weight to maintain that stability right through our, our life. Uh, but it's very easy for that 20, if that 30, 40 year old now to be something like 110 kilos. And yep. then, they, then they realize, oh, now I need to lose weight. Then you drop back to 90. That's as far as you get. And then it starts crawling back up. And then all of a sudden you're back up to 130 kilos. <laughs> then you realize, oh, I better do something about it. And so you drop back to 110. And so all these years, not only are you getting that weight fluctuation, which is a problem in itself, you never really get back to that starting point. Once you let yourself slip up, it's pretty, you just near impossible to move yourself back down to your starting point. Um, because there's just so many influences in life. 
which is it. So we try and prevent the weight gain in the first place if possible, rather than trying to get rid of it afterwards. So I, I, yeah, yeah. So if I've got a if I've got a seventy year old walking to my office and have had nothing but two wheat bigs for the for the last fifty years of their life and they're weighing one hundred and ten kilos. And the first thing is suggested, can we look at a bit of variety for your breakfast? And I said, well, I've been eating wheat mix for, <laughs> for the last few years. Well, maybe. well, no, okay, I can't say that. But essentially, by <laughs> having a bit of change, you need some change. Yeah. We need to establish change. And I'm not picking on a particular breakfast cereal, apologize that, but essentially it's that constant. That's, that's where I'm trying to get that idea into your head. Just by having a bit of change, your body, you never know where it might lead to. So having that little bit of enjoyment, more variety of food choices, things generally work for the better. We find that that's the birth, uh, uh, strategy for uh, changing our body weights, is changing, having change. We don't like that. You're, you mentioned that you're in the private sector now. You, I've seen you do seminars before in front of people, like uh, presentations. Um, if someone wants to book you for a presentation or uh, whatever, I, I'm hoping we can do a presentation here um, for some of our members in the near future. So maybe we'll open that up to the public as well. Um, where can people find you? Odd Socks. Yeah. It's in North Strathfield. Uh, our details are on the phone there and email and you can leave a message there and knocking it back. My details are on there as well too. So on the website, Odd Socks website. Yeah. Yep. And if people want to reach out in person for like a one-on-one, -on -one, same thing? I'm there and I have an office on site there as well too. Excellent. Uh, generally weekends are a better time for a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, group sessions we can organise uh, where it's mutually convenient. Awesome. And if you are a gym owner, there are a lot of gym owners that listen to this, um, maybe reach out to Pete and get him to just come out to your gym. That would be really cool. That's and nutrition is important things, but with other allied health as well too. It's a really big team. Uh, in sport, it takes a team. So you, your physios um, and uh, uh, exercise physiologists and your coaching staff and yourself as well too. Um, and we had a nice uh, conversation uh, here at Andrews Gym uh, this week, and it was a, a good opportunity for uh, first time we've ever seen some uh, gym owners having that uh, forum that they come together and let's have a, let's get to know each other, okay? Let's be part of a team rather than individual because it grows, we're growing the sport and not only Olympic sport, weightlifting, but uh, crossfitting and also just sport in general, trying to get that message out there that um, all of us at all ages can be playing sport um, for lots of reasons. Not everyone's going to go to the Olympics, but a uh, good range of us that can really achieve quite significant um, be great role models in the community and, uh, and I just aspire to be one of those people and I've just chosen to take up the, <laughs> one of the hardest sports around but with good coaching and good uh, facilities and good nutrition um, it's, it's a fun journey the journey is the part of the, that's the most enjoyable you, you, you finally get to the podium but it's a journey that got you there that you'll always be the more memorable rather than that moment of glory standing on it'll always be that um, time enjoying that dinners enjoying the Christmases enjoying the parties and, and that uh, friendship and the um, camaraderie that you have week after week that's what you'll always remember guys you can find Raw Barbell Club at Raw Barbell Club on all of our social medias. So that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Make sure you follow us on Instagram and check out our stories, check out the posts we do, get some cool information. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. You can see really cool content like this. You can see the weekly training vids of our lifters and you will see more information about things like training, diet, and tips and tricks to make your lifting better. And also, guys, if you like this episode of the podcast, just like I did, make sure you go online and check out iTunes and give us a five-star review. This was an awesome ep episode, and I think uh, if you give us a review on it, a uh, positive review, it'll uh, make the podcast be seen by more and more people. And if you, if you really liked it, just share it. That would be awesome. I think, I'm sure Pete would appreciate that too. And uh, I think that's about it. Oh, lastly, guys, uh, if, you, if you want to support the podcast, you now can. Just uh, go online, www.rawbarbellclub.com forward slash donate, 
and you can donate to the podcast. Making this podcast is a lot of fun, but we run on your donations. So I appreciate everyone that has already donated. You guys are awesome. Thanks, man, for being here. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everybody for listening. And um, it's been a nice, informal way of having a education out there. I think that's a really good way of um, just having a reflection about what you're doing today. That we're not here being prescriptive. We're just trying to say to yourself, okay, what's out there? And um, I just have to hope to be out there as part of that process for all of us. Bit of change. Thanks, for everybody. My name's Peter Tyson. Thanks, Andrew. No worries, man. Go on, Done.